We falsely think of our country as a democracy when it has evolved into a mediaocracy, where a media that is supposed to check political abuse is part of a political abuse. These commercial entities now vie with the government for authority over our lives. They are not a healthy counterweight to government. They are as big as or bigger than government, and they work closely with government. The most powerful special interest in Washington today is the media, because not only do they give money and lobby and do all the things that industries do in Washington and companies do, but they, of course, control whether or not a politician's mug gets on the tube. Now, that's power. <laughs> that's the ultimate power in a, in a political realm, is, is controlling perceptions. In George Orwell's novel, 1984, Winston Smith worked at the Ministry of Truth. But his job was not to ensure that truth was preserved. Quite the contrary. His job was to alter past news stories so that the version of the truth given by the ruling elite, the party, was never contradicted. If the party, which Orwell called Big Brother, lied to the people, a quick check of Winston's altered records, the only remaining records, would prove that the lie was true. Can lies become truth? Could a media system controlled by a few global corporations with the ability to overwhelm all competing voices be able to turn lies into truth? These corporations are not answerable to the people. Only the politicians can regulate them. Could corporations possibly buy politicians with campaign contributions? Contributions so large that the politicians would allow unregulated corporations to go about their business of eliminating less powerful voices until only one voice remained one truth. This documentary actually started 20 years ago when I was in graduate film school. It was around the time of the hostage crisis. It seemed to me at the time that the way the news was being covered was changing, and that this was typified by Rupert Murdoch's New York Post. So I went and I interviewed the editor of the New York Post on video, very primitive video. Do you think that uh, you people increase public panic sometimes about shortages? Is it possible? Yeah, I, yes, I, actually, I think that's where, it's, uh, that, that's where the panic starts, uh, through uh, the media coverage, through newspaper coverage, television coverage. Do you think that the New York Post tells the true story? Or? Well, it, sometimes you cannot uh, dip in the media. I think what they create is they create, like, gas. You can create a panic, right? New York is a tough town. can be very abrasive. Um, and I, you know, I don't, I'm not a great believer in adding to anyone's anxieties. Peter Mitchellmore was quite candid with me that day. Later I found out why. Are you leaving? Yes, go on. Uh, incompatible with the uh, newspaper. <laughs> the paper's fine, it's selling well, but it's not my kind of newspaper anymore. That's it. That day in 1980, we spoke about the hostages and the new phenomenon of the never-ending story. They were finally released the day Reagan was inaugurated. I didn't think anything of this coincidence at the time. Twenty years later, a series of extraordinary events took place. For me, they provided a window see the selling of the Iraqi war, the media's handling of the 2000 election, and the Supreme Court's decision in a new light. The question became whether there was a pattern in the way stories are covered and then dropped. Had it become easier to purposely manipulate the news? Were they not covering certain stories on purpose? 
Meanwhile, over the years, I had descended into the third world of independent film. But as it happened, right next to the review of my movie was a review of The Insider, a film about the killing of a news story. I took this as a sign, but how to get at the truth? I read about a man named Charles Lewis, an X60 Minutes producer who had created a unique nonpartisan news organization. The Center for Public Integrity broke the Clinton-Lincoln bedroom scandal. He had also done a report on George W. Bush's SEC violations for inside trading. In the 60s, three in four Americans trusted their government. Today, it's one in four uh, Americans trust the government. The level of secrecy and the amount of money in our process is greater than it's ever been. Archibald Cox, a Watergate prosecutor I interviewed for our book, The Buying of the President 2000, said the level of trust in, in this country is worse than he's ever seen it, including during Watergate. People sense, I think, that the financial elites and the political elites have become one and the same and that the people themselves have no voice in Washington or in their state capitals, that they are somehow being left behind. When we think about democracy, in the United States, we oftentimes, and I think certainly in our media culture and our political culture, the assumption is that the type of democracy we have in the United States is the only type that could possibly exist. It's the high watermark of the human race is capable of, is U.S.-style democracy. In fact, though, I think we have, both in theory and in many ways in practice, um, a fairly, what you call a weak democracy. I mean, in fact, in many ways, we have a, a frighteningly weak democracy. There is an unfortunate sense, as well, of powerlessness, that there really isn't very much that can be done about the state of things. You can't have 280 million people and say that two political parties represent the, the thinking of 280 million people. Let's just, just think about that. If you want to, just step, on, step back and look at that. And you know, the thing is, is that anthropologists, they're going to dig us up hundreds of years from now, and they are not going to understand us. No, seriously. And we've made a huge mistake inventing film and videotape because we're leaving behind a record of ourselves. We have a situation in which uh, a significant percentage of the population doesn't vote, doesn't care about the issues, uh, is tuned out entirely, is what we call depoliticized. Uh, in fact, we have a rate of depoliticization in the United States uh, that must make a tyrant, like in you know, Indonesia, envious. They say, how can I get one of these vegged out populations? The, the top 1% that controlled 90% of the wealth had two major political parties doing their bidding for them. And the other 99% had no political party on the ballot representing them. And no representation in Congress representing them. And yet that 99% ran around waving little flags going, we're free, we're free, <laughs> we live in democracy, woohoo! Oh, we're gonna look like assholes. <laughs> no, seriously, folks. We gotta leave a note behind and explain our actions. We have the more instant access to information as consumers and as citizens than we've ever had in the history of the country. That does not necessarily mean we're better informed. <laughs> and that's, the, that's a fascinating irony by itself. So there's an apposite quote from Dr. Goebbels. It's a kind of an explosive you know, thing to invoke here, but he said once, and this is an example of how sly he was, that what you want in a media system, and he meant the Nazi media system, is uh, ostensible diversity that conceals an actual uniformity. The truth of the matter is that increasingly what we see, what we hear, and what we read is being controlled by fewer and fewer large multinational corporations People don't appreciate this. You know, in the last days of the Soviet Union, you had dozens of newspapers, dozens of magazines, all kinds of radio and television stations. The only problem is that all of that media was controlled by the Communist Party of the Soviet Union or the government of the Soviet Union. We are moving in that direction. There is an illusion of, uh, of choice that's maintained when you can have 
a hundred channels on your cable system and um, you know uh, how many movies did the studios release a year now um, all these different studios and the music industry with so many labels and uh, magazine stands that go on and on and on forever well that the owners are, are you know a handful five six different companies and that is a very dangerous development for those of us who believe in a vibrant American democracy when polls tell us fewer and fewer people understand the political process, what the media does is trivialize what goes on, sensationalizes it, makes it entertain entertainment, rather than saying, look, the function of the media is to educate you to live in a democracy, which is pretty serious stuff. You got a media system that's basically a, a, a subsidiary of, of corporate America. That's all it is. You're going to have a media system that will not cover uh, stories of tremendous public moment while it will overfocus on trivial stories that don't have any resonance at all. In terms of the political process, you ask yourselves what are the most important issues facing our country? Why is it? Simple question. With all of the growth in technology, with all of the wonderful globalization and free trade, all of that stuff, all of the increases in education, why does the average American today work longer hours for low wages than was the case 25 years ago? Simple question. Do you think it's seen on television very often? What about the morality of 1% of the population owning more wealth than the bottom 95%? See that? In a New York Times editorial, Princeton economist Paul Krugman addressed one of these little mentioned issues. According to the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, between 1979 and 1997, Income for families in the middle rose 9%. Income for families in the top 1% rose 140%. Krugman noted, quote, I know from experience that even mentioning income distribution leads to angry accusations of class warfare. He then asks, why has the response to rising inequality been a drive to reduce taxes on the rich? Good question. According to Joan Didion, news is no longer just reported but managed in a way that sets its terms and shapes its overall content. Has the mainstream media become an anti-democratic force in the United States? What you want to say is, if you have a self-governing society, a democratic society, what does that society need from its journalism? I mean, what, are, what are the attributes you need to have from your journalism, from your media system to produce so that people can govern their own lives effectively? And I think there are you know, two or three things that jump out at you if you study the matter at all. And they're really not debated. Uh, one, you need a really hard watchdog. You need some, a journalism that keeps track of people in power and people who want to be in power. Hitler says in Mein Kampf that the people's power of forgetting is enormous. This is the case with mass society, right? You have to have a healthy media system in order to counteract that natural tendency. You've got to have that, because then people will be sufficiently roused by the notion of having to protect their interests to pay attention. Otherwise, if it's just a spectacle, you know, if it's just a bunch of razzle-dazzle and bullshit, people will naturally, you know, forget about it in a couple of days, and that's, that's the that's the pickle that Americans tend to be in. A CNN Gallup poll conducted in March 2003 found that 51% of the American people thought Saddam Hussein was personally responsible for the September 11th attack. Why did they think that? Forget about forgetting. They don't, they don't know. They don't know. I picked up my local paper today. Yesterday, yesterday there was a vote in the House of Representatives which would have provided, which passed, which would, if it carries into law, provide hundreds of billions of dollars in tax breaks to a handful of families in this country. It wasn't mentioned in the newspaper. The repeal of the estate tax. Half of the benefits of that repeal will go to the richest one-tenth of one percent of the population. All of the benefits will go to the wealthiest 
2% of the families in America. You got that? 98% of the families do not pay one nickel in estate tax. I walked down the street a couple of months ago. Guy goes up and he says, Bernie, I'm really angry at you. Yeah, why are you angry at you? I've got $20,000 in the bank, and I want to leave my money to my kids, and why are you stopping me from doing that? $20,000. This guy's not going to pay one penny in estate tax. People don't know that. So what they do is they poll. They've got very good pollsters, and you play off the general ignorance of the population. People don't know much. Death tax sounds pretty good. Everybody who dies, you've got to pay a huge tax to the federal government. Not true. We put the death tax on the road to extinction. The death tax is a bad tax. And yet that 99% ran around waving little flags going, we're free! Your job is, if you're at the network, to cover the basics. The basics mean that government, the entire federal government with millions of employees, is boiled down to the White House and the Capitol. You have a reporter at each place, and they're on every night. And that's, that's the extent of your federal government co news coverage. It's idiocy. Shocking. It's shocking, and it's pathetic. And so you can have an SNL scandal that goes on for years, and no one notices it, because that's an obscure... Uh, now defunct agency called the Federal Home Loan Bank Board. Well, how many reporters do you think are down there covering that? Hardly any. If a member of Congress uh, gets an appropriation for $58,000 in order to, to uh, put some funding into a house or something or into something in his community, it's liable to make the front pages. Congressman Jones gets pork, $58,000 for this stupid project. Headlines. But when you spend hundreds of billions of dollars, it is more likely that the hundreds of billions will not be covered than the 58,000. How did journalism get this way? To remove controversy uh, from story selection. So you can't be yelled at for why did you put this in the front page and didn't cover some other story. There becomes a tremendous reliance upon official sources as the basis of legitimate journalism. This was a new thing. You know, in 1875, if the governor said something wacky, a newspaper editor said, I'm not going to cover that. It was stupid. Newspapers, um, they don't invent stories. They go to people, experts in this country, uh, for their opinions on what's coming down or not coming down. It means those people in power, uh, political power especially, but also business power, are sort of the assignment editors of journalism. What they want to talk about becomes news. What they, if they agree that they don't want to debate something, like the CIA, it's virtually impossible for a journalist to introduce that as a story. If the media had been on the job during the 2000 election, for example, if they had reported what was actually going on and reported it with all due emphasis and uh, repetitiousness, kept on the story day after day. I don't mean the occasional piece on page 10 of the New York Times. I mean appropriate coverage where you follow the scandal. If that had happened, uh, Bush Cheney wouldn't be in the White House today because they weren't elected. The range of inquiry by journalists was strictly determined by what the official sources were saying. In this case, the Gore campaign and the Republicans, the Bush campaign. And journalists basically, their credible journalism volleyed between these two positions. Now, the problem with that was very simple. The two sides were playing by very different rules, very different game plans. On one side, you had the Republicans, and they were committed to winning this election no matter what. Principle be damned. They were taking power, period. That underscored everything they did. So there was no commitment to being principled whatsoever. One day, if you got the right ruling by the state Supreme Court, it's clearly a state issue. The ruling two days later goes against you. The exact same people say it's clearly a federal issue. There was no sense of shame. The point was you wanted power, period. And it was an extraordinary propaganda effort by the right because you couldn't even find a Republican dog catcher in Idaho who would disagree. Everyone barked out the exact same line every day. It was uh, Joe Goebbels would have been impressed with the lockstep in which the Republican machine marched in their eagerness to take power and take this election. The problem was for those of us who just think whoever gets the most votes should win and wanted a fair election, the journalism didn't reflect that interest. It was a prisoner of that range of debate, and therefore it played directly into the hands of the Republicans. The BBC reported that five months before the 2000 election, Governor Jeb Bush 
moved to purge 57,000 people from the voting rolls, supposedly ex-felons. The great story that was broken by Greg Palast from, the, from Britain, uh, which has now been confirmed, on the, for the first time, the use of, uh, by Catherine Harris of this private company to come up with a list of felons who wouldn't be permitted to vote, which was a dreadfully bogus list of thousands of people who weren't permitted to vote uh, who should have been. According to Palast, a private firm with Republican ties, Database Technology, signed a $4 million contract to provide scrub lists of ex-felons. Part of the job was to verify the list, which the firm acknowledged was inaccurate. The state of Florida brought in this Republican firm on the excuse that they had these databases, and when the company said, well, now we want to run the databases against this list of 57,000 names, there's a little handwritten notation that says, in Catherine Harris's office, right on the, the listing of the database checks, it says, don't need. <laughs> We will give you what they told DBT. We will give you the check if you don't check. How many of these names are wrong? Statistically, one in 20 people on the list may have committed a crime. So 95% of the people on the list, 95% of the people on the list, are kind of innocent. <laughs> Now, when I say kind of innocent, see, 54% of the people on the list are unequivocally guilty of being black. Now, you do the arithmetic, okay? 95% of a list of 57,700 people, 54% of them black. Catherine Harris certified the election of the President of the United States on the basis of a plurality in Florida of 537 votes. You do the arithmetic and you tell me what happened in that election. Palast, uh, when he first broke it, uh, CBS News called him up. And CBS News uh, said, yeah, we might want to work on this. And Palast said, well, go ahead and follow up on it. You can have it. And nothing happened for a couple of days, so Palast called up the uh, producer at CBS News and said, why aren't you covering this? And uh, the producer said, and I'm paraphrasing, well, we called up Governor Jeb Bush's office, and, and he's, he said that it wasn't true, didn't check out, so we're not going to go with it. We did not do any kind of frontal direct investigation of the media for 10 or 11 years, mostly because our, our information we put out with news conferences and things like that is disseminated through the media. So it would be, a, I, I mean, I'm being very candid here, it would not behoove me to investigate the media on a regular basis because none of the information would ever be reported and, and my organization would never be heard from again. And so I'm, I, I do, I'm not stupid, I do recognize that fact. But I have been getting so frustrated, and I decided it was time that we looked at the media. We had half a dozen people working for six months, and we investigated, and we found, of course, that the most powerful special interest in Washington today is the media. Lobbyists hire placeholders. These people line up first thing in the morning for spots in committee hearing rooms allocated to the public. A few minutes before the hearings begin, the lobbyists arrive. These guys have hundreds of lobbyists. They have nearly 300 lobbyists, paid lobbyists, and they're giving away tens of millions of dollars in campaign contributions, and they control whether or not a politician ever gets on the air all over America. That's power. Being successful lobbying at the FCC or Congress is as important to the bottom line as producing a movie that's a big hit. I mean, it's every bit as important. It's more important. That's the, you know, basically stealing stuff from government is the key. And this is where the media companies are extremely successful because they, unlike any other corporate lobby, have one thing going for them the others don't. They actually control the means by which the public can actually learn about these debates. 
you know, you know, you can mention Exxon would love to have owned the media, or Philip Morris. So any debate over cigarettes has to go through them. They took members of Congress on 315 all-expense-paid trips around the world. And then you have the FCC regulating the broadcast for 1,400 privately funded trips. The problem in this town is that a lot of the regulators that have been set up to protect the public interest have been captured by the people they're regulating. And that's been going on for years. It's not new, but it's outrageous. Regulators at the Federal Communications Commission uh, almost always upon leaving office go to work for the people they were supposedly regulating in the public interest. Beneath the reported story of greedy Enron executives is a story about the influence of money over government regulators. This is what has happened with the media companies. Rupert Murdoch is the primary owner of the News Corporation. In the United States, he owns the Fox News Network. But Murdoch's media empire is global. Among his many holdings is a satellite TV service in partnership with the Chinese. Just as he gave a huge book deal to Newt Gingrich, Murdoch gave the supreme Chinese leader's daughter a book contract to write a biography of her father. Well, if I'm going to get my book published in your capitalist society, I have to find a capitalist to publish it. <laughs> Regardless of whether it's uh, one of Mr. Murdoch's companies or not. The nature of what used to be considered a bribe has morphed into a quid pro quo, an indirect payment, and it's legal. We have massive problems with what is I call legal corruption all over America, where the system has been gamed by various powerful interests and and it's all disclosed of course of course no one reads it and the media doesn't generally report it don't get me started uh... and so so this is a wink and nod exercise with rampant corruption and the american people kind of actually in a very interesting way viscerally understand that things are corrupt I was a producer at 60 Minutes and uh, worked in network television for 11 years ABC and CBS 60 Minutes and I was an investigative reporter for those places and I quit one day my story led the show I quit because the idea of everything being simplified down to good guys and bad guys and um, uh, you know the formulaic infotainment thing was getting a little old for me. Um, I decided that I didn't want anybody telling me what to investigate, <laughs> and I was going to decide myself what to investigate, and I was going to take as long as I needed, not two weeks, to solve a 20-year-old unsolved murder. <laughs> Today, you know, we're up to 35 people. It's knock on wood, it's been very exciting, but that's how it got here. So. <laughs> You have this contracting of ambition about what should be covered and what the public has the right to know about. The price of power in Washington, who really makes money and who really benefits from the decisions. What will pass for investigative reporting is though someone may get a hold of an early report from some committee that's about to come out or an inspector general's report that's going to castigate the secretary of this or that and so you'll breathlessly go on the air and you know you'll say ABC News has learned or whatever the network is and you'll, you know you'll, you'll be out of breath and it's all exciting you're holding up a report and it'll look like uh, the faceless minions that comprise the network hundreds of them out there ferreting information out for you to serve the public it's complete bunkum of course it's, it's not happening at all The public would never know from the media that they spent $11 million to keep any free airtime provisions out of any legislation.
successfully, by the way. Edward Fritz, head of the National Association of Broadcasters, called free airtime for candidates unconstitutional and an infringement on the broadcaster's free speech rights. You have reached the stage in American politics, and I'm not kidding you, where the issue is not a debate over ideas. You, know, you have a point of view, I have a point of view. Who should that person support? That's what democracy is about. The issue is whether ideas at all matter. You look like a nice fellow, nice wife. you have any kids? Yeah, two. Okay. Why wouldn't I want to vote for you? One of the strange things about it is that politics is now presented in terms of politicians and not politics. I don't think the media are interested in politics. They're interested in politicians, which is a wholly different subject. Media corporations don't cover the news when it comes to politics anymore. Uh, the, the political news coverage in 2000 was half what it was in 96. 96 was half what it was in 92. The third leading source of revenue for the media today, broadcast media, happens to be political ads. So if you're a politician, the only way you get heard is with ads. In 1981, uh, the media was getting $80 million from political campaigns for ads. Today, they got, the last campaign, they got a billion dollars. That's why you've got to have millions of dollars to run for office as a politician. You're either a millionaire, you're able to raise large sums of money all day, dollar for dollars, and that's who goes into politics. And you are complicit in the system. You're not going to rock the boat. You know, 98% of those who run for Congress, who run again, get elected, get reelected. We have a 98% return rate in Congress. Are you aware of this? Do you know, I mean, look up the statistic. The old Soviet Politburo, had a 92% return rate, all right? They actually had more turnover than we have in the U.S. Congress. Is that just the most embarrassing thought? Why do we do this? We've got to change these laws. We grant these monopoly rights to TV stations. They don't pay a penny to the people for getting these monopoly rights to TV frequencies. Then they turn around and sell time on the public property and, and make billions of dollars and destroy our political system. All the while, they, have, they pay off the politicians themselves to keep getting these monopoly rights. The corruption here is dreadful. The public is really at a loss. What do you do about that exactly? I'm, I'm not quite sure. I mean, you can, they're probably in a, perfect world there should be a citizens movement about this people should be marching in the streets I mean in some ways we should be as angry about what's happened to our media as the Russians ought to be about what happened to their media now that would be seen as heresy inside the networks how dare you we covered stories all the time last week look at this story look at that story they, they would take issue with what I just said and probably call you an American they would call me on American and a bomb thrower and I probably won't be on any of their airwaves anymore after this interview Ten years ago, 50 companies ran the media in America. Now it's down to five to seven. Today, tonight, as I came down here, NPR was reporting on decisions that the FCC, under the control of Michael Powell, son of Colin Powell, who when asked about whether or not there was a digital divide in the world, said, I'm more worried about the Mercedes divide. I'd like to have one, but I can't afford it. That's the commissioner of the FCC, who is about to lift all the ownership caps on big media companies in an issue that is not covered in the media. Michael Powell was actually quoted as saying that he has no idea what the public interest is. The oppressor here is regulation. He actually said that. Michael Powell uh, and uh, Republicans in the office at the FCC, we were on the verge with our campaign of making major changes to the rules and the public interest obligations of broadcasters. The Federal Communications Commission had proposed rules that we pushed in this campaign I mean, uh, that hundreds of Americans in small communities, in large communities, pushed we were going to get rules that would make local broadcasters much more accountable to their interests. Uh, those rules were proposed once uh, Bill Kennard was out of office and Michael Powell was in office. Those rules went into a drawer. They were never voted on. Starting with Ronald Reagan, the holy grail of deregulation has been sold to the public. 
the news media has largely ignored its disastrous results. Once the Reagan administration was done, there were more rules. But they called it deregulation. It's uh, almost this Orwellian use of language where you create new rules, uh, but the rules change because they benefit industry, and you call it deregulation. And you say deregulation, and people feel that's good because people like deregulation. People like fewer rules. They like, you know, depending on simpler, cleaner, you know, old Western rules. But it's a trick. It's not, it's not really what's happening. <laughs> I remember when I first went into television, I believe the FCC rules were, were very stringent about how many television stations a network could own. I think it was five. And of course, uh, they had to be in different markets. And now, uh, I know here in New York, we're talking about a duopoly. That's the new word. You have the probability, it looks like right now, that uh, News Corporation will be the owners of The Post, Channel 9, and Channel 5 in the one New York marketplace. So, yeah, the regulations have eased considerably. The whole uh, ball game has changed, and precisely how that affects different people buying and selling different stations in different markets and how it impacts on the news, I, I, I don't know. In my view, there, there are tremendous effects that are almost entirely negative. There's almost nothing positive about it. First of all, it leads to this. These companies are so big, their political power grows exponentially. It's a democratic issue. It means that um, one viewpoint will come to dominate in most of the outlets that we um, use for knowing what's going on in the world. Many people are not aware that when you watch television, uh, you are watching a, a program produced by a large multinational corporation uh, that has enormous uh, conflicts of interest. General Electric and NBC is a perfect example. Um, how can we be sure we're going to get the kind of information we need to have about the nuclear industry, about um, defense contracts, and all of those things when NBC is beholden to this parent company? Why would they report on that? Of course they wouldn't. Why would ABC report on what's going on at Disney? They wouldn't. There's no point in it. Um, and it's precisely for that reason that those companies want to own television stations in the first place, so that they can keep a check on those sorts of things. General Electric has made it uh, a very p proud uh, part of their policies uh, that they are going to move jobs from the United States of America to China to Mexico, any place in the world where they can get cheap labor. This suggests obviously that General Electric is deeply concerned about our trade policies. Over the years General Electric has done its best not to pay taxes or to pay as little as they can in taxes, taking advantage of all kinds of corporate welfare tax loopholes suggests very strongly that General Electric has an interest in tax policy. Uh, General Electric is a major polluter, therefore they're concerned about weakening environmental policies. It's not obviously just uh, General Electric, it's the same thing with uh, CBS or uh, ABC. The conflicts of interest are enormous and the result is that certain issues are talked about, certain issues are not talked about. In 11, close to 11 years, we've done more than 100 reports the reports and investigations about public servants screwing up. We're the ones that broke the Lincoln bedroom scandal about the Clinton White House. But I have to tell you, when we've investigated corporations, for some reason it just doesn't get covered. <laughs> what can I say? See the Business Week uh, cover a short while ago? The majority of Americans believe that corporate America is just one corrupt institution that needs to be reined in. In some ways, Corporate power is treated like, by our news media much like communism is treated by the Soviet press. You know, in the Soviet media, the bad commissar who didn't meet the tractor quota could be uh, skewered in the media. Pravda or Task could give the guy a hard time. But the system of communism was off limits. And in many respects, the occasional capitalist or firm that uh, might make a bad tire or bad seat belt can be skewered. But the system as a whole is always off limits. In my entire political life, not one reporter has ever come up to me and said, Bernie, you know, the average worker is today working longer hours for low wages than 25 years ago. What the hell are you doing about that? Why do people have to work 50 or 60 hours a week? Never been asked to me. Why not? Because those are questions that the reporters are not allowed 
to think about. You want, in a sense, you know, people say, well, do you think, Bernie, that there's a conspiracy, that uh, Jack Welch is on the phone to every reporter for NBC telling them what to ask? Of course not. But what goes on, there's a framework of thought that you are allowed to have, and it goes from here, it goes to there. And everybody kind of has the same mindset, you know. This story plays, this is a lead because it, you know, it, it, it's, it screams, this is a, you know, everybody kind of has the same approach to it. Everybody knows about Enron and, and how uh, the guys at the top managed to cash out very handsomely while preventing the pensioners from withdrawing their money in time to prevent complete ruin, financial ruin. Well, I mean, there's a history behind this, you know. George Bush, who is, of course, a good friend of Kenneth Lay, cashed out in exactly the same way, uh, you know, as a major shareholder in Harkin. According to the Center for Public Integrity, George Bush served on the Harkin Energy's board and was able to realize a huge profit of $848,000 by selling his stock in the corporation. Harkin had concealed its losses by selling some of the firm's assets to a group of insiders and declaring a profit. Shortly after he sold, the stock price plummeted. He reported the sale to the SEC 34 weeks late. Bush was on the audit committee and the restructuring committee. He claimed he didn't know. I propose some tough new standards uh, on for corporate reform. Like you all, I took a look at I took a look out there and saw a problem. And the problem was we had some folks who were trying to fudge the numbers. We had some people who decided they weren't going to tell the truth when it came to their assets and liabilities. The Harkin Inside Trading story was reported by the Center for Public Integrity seven months before the presidential election, but the mainstream media chose not to report the story. This represents a kind of insider trading. It's obviously epidemic at the top. In the 2000 election campaign, the mainstream news media hinted that Al Gore was a liar. At the same time, the press ignored or glossed over serious questions about George Bush. From repeated allegations that he had gone AWOL to inside trading. Is there a connection between Bush's avowed policy to completely deregulate big media and their see no evil news coverage? Call it a coincidence. You know, they'll cover whatever they damn well please and it's not going to get in the way of the bottom line. It's not going to cost a lot of money to produce. And it's generally not going to uh, upset the powers that be, of which they are a major part themselves. And that's where we are as a country, and it's really grim to watch. It's very depressing. Bush made millions of dollars as governor of Texas. And his father is now making millions of dollars as a worker for Carlisle, making millions of dollars thanks to the policies of his son. His son has all around him in the White House and throughout the government, all kinds of people from Lockheed Martin. And Lockheed Martin's making out like a bandit because of the war on terrorism. Th this, is, this, this is a scandal of such magnitude, you know, that you'd think that the press would be thanking its lucky stars that it happened on their watch because it's such a great story. No, it's too big for them to cover. We know what to do with someone caught misappropriating funds, but when confronted with evidence of a systematic attempt to undermine the political system itself, we recoil in a general failure of imagination and nerve. Gary Sick, an American diplomat, 
wrote a book called The October Surprise, in which he argued that the Reagan team seems to have uh, basically meddled in the situation to make sure that the hostages didn't get released before Election Day. Gary Sick was a member of the Carter administration and on the staff of the National Security Council from August 1976 to April 1981. According to Mr. Six's congressional testimony, quote, in the course of hundreds of interviews in the US, Europe, and the Middle East, I have been told repeatedly that individuals associated with the Reagan-Bush campaign of 1980 met secretly with Iranian officials to delay the release of the American hostages until after the presidential election. For this favor, Iran was rewarded with a substantial supply of arms from Israel." End quote. According to Mr. Sick, low-level intelligence operatives and arms dealers are no Boy Scouts. End quote. Their accounts were not identical, but on the central facts, they were remarkably consistent. Because of my past government experience, I knew about certain events that could not possibly be known to most of the sources. Yet their stories confirm these facts. Again, quoting Gary Sick, from October 15th to October 20th, 1980, events came to a head in a series of meetings in Paris. Accounts of these meetings vary. There is, however, widespread agreement on a number of points. One. William Casey, Reagan's campaign manager, was a key participant. Two, Iranian representatives agreed that the hostages would not be released prior to the presidential election on November 4th. Three, in return, Israel would serve as a conduit for arms and spare parts to Iran. Quote, at least five of the sources who said they were in Paris in connection with these meetings insist that George Bush was present for at least one meeting. Three sources say they saw him there. Former President George Bush denied being in Paris. According to Sick, immediately after the Paris meetings, things began to happen. Iran publicly shifted its position in the negotiations with the Carter administration, disclaiming any further interest in receiving military equipment. Again, according to Sick, between October 21st and October 23rd, Israel sent a plane load of F-4 fighter aircraft tires to Iran in contravention of the U.S. boycott and without informing Washington. There was a congressional investigation into this claim eventually. It was grossly inadequate. It was a real whitewash. A lot of questions were never even entertained, much less answered. In 1991, a congressional committee led by Democratic Congressman Lee Hamilton declared there to be no credible evidence linking Reagan's team with a delay in the hostages' release. In two contemporaneous magazine articles, charges of an October surprise were discounted. According to Mr. Sick, quote, after listening to the evidence, one of the former hostages I spoke with said simply, I don't want to believe it. It's too painful to think about. Whatever the truth of the October surprise may be, what is undeniable is that the story is a career graveyard for journalists seeking to work in the corporate mainstream. If you read what uh, the hostages themselves had to say later in their various reminiscences of the experience, and you read some of the press coverage in depth, you, 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 you find that the Iranians were guarding the hostages, had their uh, stopwatches out. I mean, they were, they were waiting for a particular moment to let those hostages run into uh, the uh, field of vision of the photographers who were all there waiting to take their picture. Do you agree with the statement? Whatever is regularly broadcast is the definition of what is news. Or do you have another definition? Um, <laughs> that is a good question because, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if, it, if it happens but you don't hear about it, did it happen? But by and large, on the right at least, media and concern about media is at the top of the list. 
Republicans and the right wing mobilized, they organized, they trained people to be in the media. Uh, right wing foundations spend money on media programs, they fund and subsidize a media presence to create an environment friendly to the views of a real minority in our country by actual numbers. In 1971, Lewis Powell, a corporate lawyer, was two months from being nominated to the Supreme Court by President Nixon. He wrote a memorandum expressing his concerns about how consumer activists and progressives were infecting the general population with an anti-corporate bias. This treatise circulated among a number of wealthy industrialists. One of them was Joseph Coors, who in 1972 provided initial financing of $250,000 for the Heritage Foundation. So began the neoconservative movement to influence the media. What we've seen since the mid-1970s is that all the great conservative foundations have uh, devoted almost all their money to ideological warfare. So much of journalism depends on who the source of the story is. And so you've seen the creation of these foundations or institutes in Washington, like the American Enterprise Institute, the Heritage Foundation, the Cato Institute, that basically are extraordinarily well-funded groups. Reclusive billionaire Richard Mellon Scaife funds many of the right-wing think tanks. He also underwrote the Arkansas Project, a four-year multi-million dollar effort to investigate President Clinton. What has happened is resident fellows at the think tanks are paid to create rationales for predetermined economic and political positions, much like it was done in the old Soviet Union. The truth of the matter is that billions of dollars are being spent to convince the public that their interests and those of the corporations are the same. first few times they employ one of these right-wing experts, they'll be called from the conservative American Enterprise Institute or from the conservative Cato Institute. But over time, they just drop that. And pretty soon, it's just from the Cato Institute. And pretty soon, it's just analysts. If you're a source and you can have, have someone weighing on trade deals, on Supreme Court appointments, on tax bills, giving your perspective, if you've got a series of people who are, sound like they know what they're talking about of all sorts of degrees, you can really influence the news. Powell singled out commercial TV and the judiciary as areas to influence. TV because it shapes people's minds. The judiciary because many crucial decisions are made by the courts. We have always had an unrealistic view of our judiciary. We don't hold our, our judges and our judiciary in general to the same standards of reporting as we do the legislative branch or the executive branch. There's much less coverage. If the Supreme Court had done for Al Gore what it did for George Bush, I give you a 100% guarantee that I would have written the same identical book, The Betrayal of America. Five members of the United States Supreme Court committed, in my opinion, and I feel very strongly about this, one of the biggest and most serious crimes in American history when they stopped the recount in Florida, took the election away from the American people, and handed it to George Bush. And in a fair and just world, these five justices belong behind bars as much as any American white-collar criminal who has ever lived. The mainstream media, they don't even want to talk about what the court did anymore. Their position is, and they've made it very, very clear, the election is over with, we've moved on to covering other matters. Now mind you, and this is not to defend President Clinton, but this is the same group, the mainstream media, who pursued Clinton, not just day after day, not just week after week, not just month after month, but year after year. These five justices are ardent federalists, states' rights advocates. And they've said over and over again, we let state courts interpret state law. December the 8th, the Florida Supreme Court ordered a manual recount. The recount started the following morning, a Saturday, December 9th, 8 o'clock. At that point in time, Bush's lead had shrunk over Gore to 154 votes. 2 o'clock in the afternoon, Justice Antonin Scalia steps in with an emergency order supported by the four other justices. He said, we've got to stop this recount because if it continues, it could, quote, threaten irreparable harm to George Bush, unquote. So even though the election had not yet been decided, the incredible Scalia 
was presupposing that Bush had won the election, and any recount that showed that Gore had won would threaten irreparable harm to George Bush. Now, if that doesn't show that these justices were trying to steal the election for George Bush, what in the world would? We're supposed to believe as Americans that all judges have some sort of saint-like qualities, that they're not p political in any way, and that we can't even discuss it. Justice Clarence Thomas's wife works for the Heritage Foundation, a very conservative think tank in Washington, D.C., that assisted Governor Bush in his transition to power. We don't look at their financial holdings. We don't look at the trips they take to conferences sponsored by ideological groups that want them to rule certain ways. The night of the election, November 7th, Sandra Day O'Connor's at a cocktail party in Washington, D.C. with her lawyer husband, John. Dan Rather comes on the air at 8 o'clock and announces that it looks like Florida is going for Al Gore. Whereupon O'Connor blurts out, that's just terrible. She was angry. She was upset. Uh, the Wall Street Journal found three witnesses at the party to confirm that story. Newsweek found two. Both the Wall Street Journal and Newsweek went to Sandra Day O'Connor for a comment. She declined comment. Eugene Scalia is considered, widely considered to be one of the most qualified lawyers ever nominated to the post. The ties that bind Scalia and Bush's lawyer Ted Olson, who argued before the Supreme Court, come together in the Federalist Society, a judicial group with close ties to corporately funded think tanks. Society members like Judge Sentel in turn reject media regulation. Conservative judges have ruled that constraining the reach of media corporations violates their free speech rights. If you read the First Amendment, there's no question but that free speech rights are rights that belong to citizens. They're individual rights. They're our rights. In the 70s, we started to get this new idea of uh, commercial free speech. This is a very, very peculiar notion, commercial free speech. Because what it, what it does is it casts corporations, uh, corporate entities, as, as, as persons, which they're not. I mean, they're not people. They don't, you can't find their graves anywhere, unfortunately. The First Amendment has been warped so that we understand it now as a way uh, to uh, essentially allow people who own media uh, license to do whatever they want to do with the media that they own, with the property that they buy. The First Amendment becomes a barrier to understanding our responsibilities in a democracy. Free speech, when you're talking about the media, it's just a uh, fundamentally um, disproportionate right. My speech is equal to and as free as the speech of AOL Time Warner when they have uh, this platform of access to the world that, you know, I mean, I'm one person. Somehow, the freedom to inform the general public has become the exclusive right of media corporations. Giving them uh, free speech rights was, was a perverse move. And in fact, it was the kind of thing that conservatives, rock-ribbed conservatives, had ruled out, uh, you know, as recently as the 40s. During the Clinton administration in 1996, behind closed doors, the rules of the airwaves were rewritten. In radio, all regulation was literally thrown out. Small independent stations were bought up. Localism disappeared. Companies like Clear Channel went from owning a few stations to owning over 1,100 and dominating whole markets. But something else happened. Under Reagan, in 1987, the Fairness Doctrine was eliminated. Radio and TV stations were no longer required to air opposing viewpoints. This is partially responsible for the rise of right-wing radio. All the time, from coast to coast. 
The vice chairman of Clear Channel is Tom Hicks. In 1998, Mr. Hicks purchased the Texas Rangers baseball team in a deal that made President Bush a multimillionaire. Clear Channel banned Dixie Chick songs because the lead singer criticized the president on the run-up to the war. A famous middle-aged rock and roller called me last week to thank me for speaking out against the war, only to go on to tell me that he could not speak himself because he fears repercussions from Clear Channel. They promote our concert appearances, he said. They own most of the stations that play our music. I can't come out against this war. Why didn't we find out more about that bill before it was passed? Well, because who's going to report on it, the media? According to Bill Moyers, during the Senate debate, Senator John McCain said, you will not see this story on any television or hear it on any radio broadcast. Altogether, the three major network news shows aired a sum total of only 19 minutes of coverage on the Telecommunications Act over the course of nine months. When a consumer group called the Consumer Federation of America got some money from the long distance phone companies who were also for their own different reasons opposed to the bill, they tried to buy a 30 second spot on CNN saying that this concentration of power in the hands of a few companies would cause cable TV rates to go through the roof and phone rates to go up and CNN would not even accept their money. They wouldn't even let a consumer group, a dissenting group, buy, it, buy their way in to the story. Each time a new communications technology has emerged, a few companies soon gain total control over it. Will this happen with the internet? Well, up until now, the internet has been governed by a system requiring open access. The telephone network uh, on which the dial-up internet is based has been a common carrier, has been open. So anybody could have a website, anybody could transmit anything, and you could have all kinds of companies competing to provide you with internet service. Open access is being replaced now by a system of closed access. So companies like AOL Time Warner and Comcast and Paul Allen's Charter, they're opposed to any kind of open access rules. They say, we want to control internet delivery. And I'll tell you something that I remember in the late 70s, that there were all these people who were like cable television as panacea. It reminds me a little bit of, oh, the web will solve every problem. We'll have a level playing field where your new website will be able to compete with Disney and Murdoch and Viacom's new website. No. You know, one of the myths of our society, you've probably heard this one, is it's based on competition. Have you heard that? That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's the sort of pablum they feed us in the bottom fish. The truth of the matter is at the top of the system, the key to the system is crushing competition. So what we've seen in media, in all the sectors, you've had fewer and fewer companies. The largest companies buy the small companies. They try to get bigger and bigger and make it harder for new companies to enter. Because once you have just a handful of companies dominate an industry, the ability for someone to enter the industry as a newcomer is almost impossible. I think there are lots of ways that you make news more profitable and it doesn't mean, f it doesn't make for better news. If you ask the reporter, are you interested in truth, of course they'll all say yes. If you go to journalism conferences, which I do quite a bit of, everyone is looking for the truth. The problem is the gatekeepers of truth are not the reporters, they're the owners. And they're the um, lackey editors who work for the owners. 
and they'll decide what flies and what works and what pays the freight in terms of the advertising and the numbers. They'll be watching those numbers, and those numbers better be up or they'll get a new anchor. The thing that, that you know, that, that we base our, you know, our coverage, is it a good day or is it a bad day, is the numbers. I mean, I wish, you know, I wish we didn't have to rely on that so much. I wish, you, you know, there was some way that, you know, you could base, you know, your job or, or a performance on something other than the numbers. Unfortunately, that's not the, the climate right now. You look at, at news directors who get hired, because they, those are the ones that, that are really on the chopping blocks. They, I, you know, I think their jobs are less secure than Major League Baseball managers. That's not news. That's marketing. That, I mean, that's something else. I, I never heard of doing news based on going for some demographic. You do the news. <laughs> Call me crazy, but that's what you do. You investigate something because it needs to be investigated or someone's clearly lying or there's some issue of the public trust that needs to be looked into. You don't do it because you think some demographic will particularly enjoy the story. I mean, that, that's nutty. And it's the underlying theme of all the great laments we see, of all the journalists you talk to now, we're so appalled that the public service they entered has become a purely commercial activity. A pundit is defined as a learned person. According to James Fallows in his book Breaking the News, pundits are celebrities telling us what to think of events. Howard Kurtz, the media reporter for CNN, said, quote, The culture of news has merged with the relentlessly glitzy world of entertainment, producing one great roaring ooze of headlines and hype. Margaret Carlson of Time Magazine said producers want people who can sound learned without confusing the matter with too much knowledge. I'm perfect. Jeff Greenfield of CNN said, We're booked as entertainers. We know what we're being paid for. We are being paid to fill seats. FaceTime on television translates into big time lecture fees. According to Brian Lamb of C-SPAN, the message from Washington in the last 20 years is that everyone does everything for money. George Will said, if you pick your audiences carefully, you can give the same speech every time. McLaughlin said, it's important to go on the road, where you'll get to hear the whole range of views from the trade association. These speaking engagements are usually given to business and trade associations and paid for by corporations. It's the whole essence now, almost, of uh, selling some sort of regressive policy, like getting rid of Social Security or environmental regulations, is to dress it up in some name to suggest just the opposite. So if you're going to try to get rid of environmental regulations, you call your group Save the Environment. Uh, the, you know, that's the name of the group that's trying to get rid of the regulations. Crazy, crazy Jane is dead. When Reagan vetoed the Fairness Doctrine, he said it was inconsistent with the tradition of independent journalism. It's what Orwell would call uh, the politically euphemistic language uh, that is used by everyone, by politicians, but also by news anchors. We live in an era now where uh, media has become so used to accepting the spin and accepting the structures that they are given that they don't cover news anymore. Can lies pose as truth? Winston had a friend at the Ministry of Truth named Syme, who was sure that they could. His job was to eliminate words. The aim was to narrow the range of thought by eliminating words that make real thought possible. There would only be good and evil. Everything that Big Brother represented was good. Everything that opposed Big Brother was evil. As Syme explained to Winston, the whole climate of thought will be different. There will be no thought as we understand it now. Orthodoxy means not thinking. One of these days, thought Winston, Syme will be vaporized. He sees too clearly. 
speaks too plainly. One day he will disappear. You heard that 175,000 votes were not counted in the state of Florida. But it's not like everybody's vote counted or was not counted the same. The number of votes not counted was in direct proportion, county to county, to the black population of the county. So how could it be that, for example, in Gadsden County, 52% of the population is black and one out of eight votes was not counted? One out of eight. Whereas in white counties like Citrus, almost all white, only one in 200 ballots was voided. How did this happen? And I go down to Florida. I go to Lehigh County. We're all looking at chads, you know, the guys looking at the hang of chads and all that. And they, they make it sound like it's this big, mysterious deal checking the ballots in Florida. Most, a big hunk of Florida votes by paper ballot, which is read by machine. You know, if you ever took like the S18 and use those number two pencil, you stick it in the machine, you know, they read. It's an optical reader. So they had a practice voting machine set up in a supervisor's office in Tallahassee. And so I voted, took out my pretend ballot, and I voted for Nader, and I voted for Buchanan. And I stuck the Buchanan-Nader ballot into the voting machine. And it came back. I stuck it in again. Came back. I said, oh, hey, wait. I'm trying to vote here, and it won't take my ballot. He said, of course not. You marked it for two candidates. You made a mistake. He won't accept a mistake on ballot. I said, what do you mean? All those votes were, were voided in Gadsden. Now, Leon County is a white county, Tallahassee. Gadsden's right next door to the black county. He said, oh, well, see, there's this switch. And in the black counties, like Gadsden, the same exact machines were set to accept ballots with errors. They would accept, you'd make a mistake on your ballot, very easy to do on a paper ballot, like you circle a name instead of check it off. The ballot's accepted, it's voided, your vote doesn't count. And in more of the white areas, it was set on reject so that if you made a mistake and you voted, it came back to you, you were given a fresh ballot, and you got to vote again. And the losers in this were the American people, whatever your political views, because we all have a right to have the person who actually won the election take power. We all have the right uh, to there be a fair count. Helen Thomas, Dean of the White House Reporters, was quoted as saying that Bush is the worst president she has covered, the worst president ever. At President Bush's pre-war news conference, for the first time in 40 years, Helen Thomas was not allowed to ask a question. She had disappeared. A chill wind is blowing in this nation. A message is being sent through the White House and its allies in talk radio and Clear Channel and Cooperstown. If you oppose this administration, there can and will be ramifications. In the last several years, media corporations and politics have merged in a new way. Murdoch is a brilliant man who, what he has done and has had a tremendous influence in the worst possible way on culture and on media uh, in the United States and throughout the world. And what he does, he does it in England and he does it in the United States. His shtick is appealing to working class people and taking them to the right. And he does this through violence. He does this through super patriotism. He does this through sensationalism. So what you have now, and I'll give him credit for this, Fox Television is the first major network that has no pretense. I mean, CBS and NBC, they have a pretense to objectivity. Rupert Murdoch's Fox News Network is run by Roger Ailes. Ailes was the executive producer of TV for Richard Nixon. He was a consultant to Ronald Reagan, and George Bush the first. Tony Snow, a host, was a Bush speechwriter. The anchor, Britt Yoon, contributed articles to the ultra-conservative American Spectator. The phrase fair and balanced is repeated incessantly, like a mantra. Fair, balanced. Goebbels said, if you repeat a lie often enough, 
people will believe it. All of their uh, talk shows are controlled by extreme right-wing Republicans. And it is a front for the right wing of the Republican Party. John Ellis, the head of Fox's election desk, Jeb and George W. Bush's first cousin. And it's notable that on election night, the first network to declare that George W. Bush had won the presidency of the United States was Fox. And it was John Ellis who made the calculation and the determination that they should make that call. But it's not only Fox. At GE, the wall between journalism and politics was also broken. According to the Reuters News Service, former General Electric Chairman Jack Welch came into the NBC studio and insisted that the race be called for fellow Republican George Bush. All the while, an NBC in-house taping system was recording Welch in the studio that night. NBC refused to turn over the tape despite repeated requests from Congressman Henry Waxman. NBC President Andrew Lack claimed turning over the tape would infringe on the editorial process. Waxman replied, Mr. Welch is not a journalist. And we now know the studies show pretty clearly, they, as they understood, they lost the vote. If there had been a fair vote, they would have been out of power. Calling the election for George Bush that night set the tone for any recount scenarios. And the whole tenor of the coverage followed that. If you watch Chris Matthews, O'Reilly, Brian Williams, when is Gore going to finally give up? Another desperation measure by Gore. The assumption being Bush had won. Gore is just scra scrambling, trying to sneak his way in through some loophole. The irony is that as the corporate news media has moved to the right, charges of a liberal bias have become pervasive. This impression was created because the Republicans have an arsenal of on-air pundits, adept at polarizing opinion, and ridiculing anyone who disagrees. And they can rely on Murdoch-owned media assets. Some stories disappear. Others are repeated endlessly. Murdoch, in turn, gets his deregulation. A conservative pundit, Bill Salmon, has written a book about Al Gore's attempt to steal the election. I find out that the party launching his book will be full of lobbyists and pundits and decide to go videotape them. Funny thing is, these behind the scenes operators don't like to be taped. As the right got more and more of a toehold in, in, in the media culture generally, through the efforts of Heritage and Hoover Foundation and others, that myth became increasingly serviceable, you see. You could cow moderates, much less liberals. You could cow anyone who wasn't a right winger working in the media by constantly assailing them with accusations of liberal bias or by assailing them about a lack of patriotism. The argument is no longer made that news media are hard on Republicans and easy on, on Teddy Kennedy and Ralph Nader. That's not the argument. That argument is so ludicrous as it, would, it doesn't even pass the giggle test. The argument now simply redefines left to right entirely in ways that drop out core issues of class core issues of corporate power. The media does not discuss the growing uh, you know, inequity between the rich and the poor and the disappearance of the middle class. I could go on and on and on. There is no evidence whatsoever for the claim that there's a liberal bias in the media. It's based entirely on a stereotypic view of the reporters themselves, many of whom may be liberals, probably they're centrists by now, but the fact is that their own personal views have nothing to do with what gets on TV. Winston Smith worked at the Ministry of Truth. His job was to alter past news stories so that the version of the truth given by the ruling elite was never contradicted. One of the most troubling things about the media's handling of the 2000 election came a year later. A consortium of major news organizations hired the respected National Opinion Research Council, called NORC, 
to inspect the 170,000 uncounted votes. Nork was not allowed to characterize its findings. The media companies did that. And the disturbing thing is that they hid the truth by distorting the Florida Supreme Court's actual ruling, which called for the counting of all votes where the intent of the voter was clear. According to the BBC's Greg Pallast, who watched the Nork counting operation firsthand, one counter said, quote, it screamed at you. If someone circled Gore, exactly who do you think they wanted as president? The consortium did not comment on the exclusion of tens of thousands of clearly marked ballots, which the Nork data reveals. Instead, the consortium came up with a tortured analysis that showed Bush would have retained a lead under one method of counting, just the undervote. On December 24, 2000, on NBC's Meet the Press, the moderator, Tim Russert, said the following, Florida, Florida, Florida is over. The board is now retired. And that was pretty much the end of the mainstream news media's coverage of the Florida recount and the Supreme Court's decision to stop the counting of votes. Had Nicaragua had an election like this and the Sandinistas won, the very people who won the Republican election would have insisted that we not only invade Nicaragua, but that all the people who engineered the election be held for war crimes. They know that they're not there serving at the will of the American people. They know that they stole this election and they created this fraud by keeping African Americans away from the polls. They know this. But if they would do this, if they would stoop this low to steal our White House, <clears throat> what else would they do? What else are they capable of? What else are they capable of? I want to know. So what we have here is not the sunlight of democracy, but the dark, ominous shadows of totalitarianism, despotism, fascism. In a curious footnote, over the next two years, the Voter News Service, which had called Florida for Al Gore, was to be revamped for the 2002 midterm elections. Suddenly, exit polls had become unreliable. Then, on election night 2002, they weren't used. There were vague statements by the mainstream news media. As it turns out, the major networks own the Voter News Service. My guess is that the Voter News Service got it right on election night when they called Florida for Al Gore. According to congressional testimony, at that time, the Voter News Service projected Gore winning Florida by 7.3%, the equivalent of more than 300,000 votes. The Voter News Service was the smoking gun. It had to disappear. Welcome to computer voting, the newest twist in our voting process. With no paper trail. what everybody remembers is Big Brother. That's the cliche from 1984. Let me remind you of another part of the story. The leader realized that he needed the permanent war in order to frighten the people into giving up their rights. What happens when a group of people have unaccountable media power and can redefine the rules without being questioned. On September 25, 2002, as the United States moved toward war, relatives of the 9-11 victims spoke. This press conference was not on the evening news. My brother, Jim Patorti, 
worked on the 95th floor of the North Tower of the World Trade Center and lost his life on September 11th. And one of the hardest things I had to do was to tell my parents that they would not be seeing their oldest son again. No one victim of violence or war is less or more important than any other. So my brother, who was seen as a type of collateral damage in some fanatics' eyes, his, his death is no more or less important than the collateral damage of someone in Iraq or Afghanistan. It's a leveling uh, commonality that we have in this people. And so for those people who are making decisions about leading us into this very dangerous era, if they have an open invitation, they can come to my house over the holidays. My brother's birthday is right before Christmas. They can see what it's like to be around a family who's affected by war and terrorism. We believe that this aggressive act, this unilateral act, will only inflame anti-Americanism that is already in the Middle East among Arab communities. It is a factor in leading fanatics to commit crimes against us like September 11th. And they're saying to America, look, don't use this as a basis to go to war. Without the sin, you, don't, you no longer have a democracy. You have a dictatorship. And that's what we're getting from the White House. Oceania is at war with East Asia. Oceania has always been at war with East Asia. Well, in the novel, of course, Oceania has not always been at war with East Asia. In fact, Oceania and East Asia were allies against Eurasia. But it, it suits the purposes of the inner party to make everybody think that the latest situation has always been the case. How is that any different from George W. Bush uh, constantly mentioning the horrific fact that Saddam Hussein gassed his own people uh, in, in 1988? at Halabja. How is it any different when at the time the U.S. actually had foreknowledge that he had uh, chemical weapons, knew that he had gassed his own people and did not protest back then? Saddam Hussein was uh, a darling of the Reagan and Bush administrations. The thing that is most amazing to me is the lying that goes on today. Um, um, you are now teaching, I'm not making this up, we are teaching damage control and spin. I remember in this country we used to call spin lying. Now we call it spin and we study it and we admire it. How to put out a line of bull and have it fly for more than 24 hours and then they high five each other because they beat the other side if it's another party or it's another candidate uh, or it's another company if it's one company with another with their annual report or their quarterly earnings or this or that. Public relations has overcome our whole society. It's all PR. Sat at his computer, turned it on and tied in to the world's mind. Hidden, brought up since a baby with his enhanced memory online and The symbiosis had been well designed. Crazy, crazy Jane is dancing. Crazy Jane's the dancer. Crazy Jane's the dance singer. Pure on up tomorrow in her own defense. Tommy had been taught to value anything that better kept the world flying. Commissioner Copps. Good morning. I strongly dissent to this decision because today the Federal Communications Commission empowers America's new media elite with unacceptable levels of influence over the ideas and information upon which our society and our democracy depend. At issue is whether a few corporations will be ceded enhanced gatekeeper control over the civil dialogue of our country, more content control over our music, entertainment and information, and veto power over what the majority of our families watch, 
read, and hear. Radio deregulation gives us powerful and relevant lessons. When Congress and the Commission remove radio concentration protections, we experience massive and largely unforeseen consequences. Diversity of programs suffered. Homogenized music and standardized programming crowded out local and regional talent. Creative local artists found it ever more difficult to obtain playtime. Editorial opinion polarized. Competition in many towns became non-existent as a few companies brought up virtually every station in the market. This experience ought to terrify us as we consider visiting upon television and newspapers what we have inflicted upon radio. Concerns about the degradation of broadcast content do not justify government manipulation of consumer choice. Degradation is just an elitist way of saying programming that one does not like. The decision allows the giant media companies to buy up the remaining local newspaper and exert massive influence over a community by wielding three TV stations, eight radio stations, the cable operator, plus the already monopolistic newspaper. The decision further allows the already massive television networks to buy up even more local TV stations so that they could control up to an unbelievable 80 or 90 percent of the national television audience. Where are the blessings of localism, diversity, and competition? I see centralization, not localism. I see uniformity, not diversity. I see monopoly and oligopoly, not competition. It would be anathema to the First Amendment to regulate media ownership in an effort to steer consumers towards other programming. Ninety percent of the top cable channels are owned by the same giants that own the TV networks and the cable systems. More channels are great, but when they're all owned by the same people, Cable doesn't advance localism, editorial diversity, and competition. And those who believe the Internet alone will save us from this fate should realize that the dominating Internet news sources are controlled by the same media giants who control radio, TV, newspapers, and cable. I refuse to pour one ounce of cement to support a structure that dictates to the American people what they should watch, listen to, or think. The public reaction against the proposed changes has been unlike anything the FCC has ever seen. Of the nearly three-quarters of a million comments we have received, nearly all oppose increased media consolidation, over 99.9%. Those commissioners voting in favor of the item signify by saying aye. 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 Those those opposed signify. No. The item is adopted. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned. The list of well-recognized people and organizations who oppose all or part of the FCC's media ownership rules is one of the strangest list of strange bedfellows you'll ever hear. Opponents include Walter Cronkite, William Sapphire, the National Rifle Association, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, the National Organization for Women, Senator Jesse Helms. But theoretically, do your regulation is good, but it's not always the right way to go. In the shadow of the largest corporate scandals in the history of this country, the last thing we need is to have regulators with no teeth. I believe it appears to me so evident that the big interests were served here at the expense of the public interest. Would you not agree with me that today those who most aggressively celebrate your decision are the biggest economic interests in broadcasting in this country. Are they not the ones that are celebrating your decision? I have no idea who's celebrating our decision. You really don't? Are you kidding me? You say they're modest changes. Clearly they're not modest changes. When, when in nearly 200 cities, newspapers will be able to buy the television station, you say that uh, it'll promote more competition. Nonsense. The evidence suggests that is simply not the case. You say that there'll be few mergers and acquisitions. Of course, that stands logic on its head. And you say the court made us do it. The court didn't make you do it. I mean, this is the, the old joke in the movie, who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes? Commissioner Abernathy, you said that uh, we were acting out of irrational fear instead of hard facts with respect to the issue of consolidation. 
Is there any uh, evidence that you see with respect to consolidation, particularly with respect to radio in recent years, and also television, that would suggest we have an irrational fear of consolidation? What you have to balance here is you have to balance the First Amendment rights of the licensees against the rights uh, of all the, uh, the public to have diversity, localism, and competition. The founders did not anticipate uh, the protections for commercial speech that we now have, and nor did they anticipate essentially the warp to uh, the sense of the First Amendment that has occurred really since the 1970s. We have to revisit the terms. What did they mean? What were they talking about? They can't possibly have meant that there should be free speech rights for transnational corporations because there weren't any back in the 18th century. They didn't exist. They weren't thinking of that. They were thinking of the citizens of the democracy. Citizens have First Amendment rights to a diversity of antagonistic views. Media reform is something that is absolutely crucial. It is the primary issue. It is the most important thing. Nothing is more important because if we don't have a media system that we can use to get our word out, whatever our word may be, if there is not a viable democratic media system for getting that word out, forget it. You know, we're screwed. We're completely screwed. We need antitrust activity, okay? And, and that's a complicated thing, and it will require that we rethink the, the very basis of antitrust law, which at the moment is all economistic. We have to understand that the real reasons why we particularly need to look at antitrust in the realm of media industries is not, be, not for business reasons, not for economic reasons primarily, but because the content, the crucial content of the news is, is completely distorted by uh, uh, large commercial interests. For the 2004 election, the major networks hired Edison Media Research and Matoski International to conduct exit polls. Throughout Election Day, those polls suggested that John Kerry would win the popular vote by 3%. The official vote count showed Bush winning by 2.5%, a discrepancy of 5.5%, or 8 million votes. The mainstream news media dismissed these polls. but in a fit of irony, used the Ukrainian exit polls as a basis to call that election into question. And except for the internet, the story largely disappeared. On January 19, 2005, Edison Matovsky released a report on their exit polls. The New York Times ran the story the next day, Inauguration Day on page A14. A group of academics and statisticians from a number of major universities analyzed the report. Quote, Edison Matovsky assumes the correctness of the election results, which their own data undercuts. The pollsters surmise that somehow Maybe more Kerry voters responded to the polls. But no data in the report supports the hypothesis that Kerry voters were more likely than Bush voters to cooperate with pollsters. And the data suggests the opposite may have been true. In the face of pervasive reports of voting anomalies in Ohio, Representative John Conyers conducted an inquiry that raises even more questions. He also called upon the networks. In a letter, he requested the raw poll data. I am hopeful that the media companies will also understand and support the importance of providing complete 
and transparent information in this matter. If it happens but you don't hear about it, did it happen? Some reporters have compared George W. Bush to Ronald Reagan. I reflected back on the Post interview from 1980 and about the hostages. How often do major news stories get buried down the public memory hole while a lie is turned into truth? There's a window of opportunity now. Most governments, and, uh, most countries have not figured out how to limit access to the, to the Internet, and they've not figured out, and powerful companies have not figured out how to block information that is inconvenient or unfriendly to them or that they don't like off of the Internet, at least in this brief window that we have before they all figure it out. Will history repeat itself? Will the public find out about the threat to the internet before it's too late? We're not in the clear here at all. I mean, this is not a straight shot here where we can just go ahead and do whatever we want. It's, it's complicated, but, but it's new, and there's some things we don't know about it and no one else knows about it. And as long as there's a, is there the slightest bit of vagueness or the unknown element is, is something I'm going to exploit as much as possible. <laughs>
wish I would never, ever, ever send in a proposal to do a biography of George W. Bush. Obviously, if he's a convicted felon, his credibility is nothing, but his story was totally ridiculous. The George Bush campaign has been saying that it's, quote, libelous and untrue, as if they have to be redundant when they're lying about us. We're the new publishing company that bought it. They cannot release it for legal reasons. Maybe I am the super, and maybe I had to sweep them off just to have this great little office here in the basement, but uh, we have a right. At the time that the giveaway of Digital Spectrum was being discussed, and the as a key part of the telecommunications reform bill, so-called reform of 1996, critics were saying this isn't about high-definition TV. This isn't about each each media owner giving you know producing a better picture of their already existing programming. This is about them spinning Channel 7 into Channel 7A through G and making a profit in each of those different sub-channels. But we couldn't be heard in the mainstream media. People that were saying that that's a likely scenario were censored in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Can that law be changed? Well, the law can be changed only if a movement forms of grassroots citizens who elect a new kind of Congress that is n somehow not beholden to the big media owners, but is beholden to what's a good idea in communications policy, yeah, clearly it could be changed. But the, the, it's a chicken and egg argument. Um, the chicken that currently squawks is the one that's, you know, is a Congress that's controlled by the media owners. If you could replace the media owners, I mean, if you could replace the Congress, you could change the media laws. And that could be done very quickly. There's nothing mysterious about how to reform the media. Instead of delivering it 95%, 98% to uh, six or 10 giant conglomerates, you could do what was proposed in the 1930s in this grassroots movement behind the Wagner-Hatfield Amendment. And you could say, let's take a bunch of these licenses, TV and radio licenses, and let's distribute some to educational institutions. They can do what they want with them some labor unions, some family farmer groups, some religious institutions, uh, some consumer groups. Let's just distribute the licenses to nonprofit groups, not 99% or 98% or 95% giant conglomerates. Let's take 20% of the licenses or 50% of the licenses and give them out to nonprofits. I mean, there's, there's nothing mysterious about changing the media policy. And indeed, we have so much technology. We're on the verge of a communications revolution, which is being stopped and stymied because a handful of corporations control the media. But we now have the possibility of what, are, what could be called citizen journalists, where it's now so much easier to produce a high-quality high publication because the layout is so much cheaper and, and distribution through the Internet is so cheap. And you can produce high-quality, as you know better than me, a video. Um, because the cameras are better and cheaper and the digital editing is better and cheaper. So everyone knows that we could be having a revolution in democracy and journalism. Everyone doesn't know, maybe. Anyone who knows the field, right. Only, I mean, the people that are in the field, believe me, the media owners know. The conglomerates that write the law that make sure they are the gatekeepers that stymie, that, you know, as we say, there are eight or ten corporations that have their foot on the uh, windpipe of the First Amendment. They're sitting on the windpipe of the First Amendment. They know it. People who do your kind of work know it. But we have this ability now to do such quality journalism at such a cheaper cost. And research is much cheaper through the web. So, you, you know, in the old days, it cost so much to afford an AP tick, ticker tape where you'd have the hourly news coming into your newsroom. That was in the hands of a few thousand places. Now it's in the hands of a few million people. So the ability to produce journalism is we're, we're on the verge of uh, unbelievable democratization of journalism. The 
terms of and, becoming possibly even broadcast. Right. Oh, yeah, broadcast quality and seen by many people. But see, no one knows that better than the handful of media owners, and they're the ones that write the laws that benefit them and prevent the flowering of democracy and the flowering of journalism. But changing the laws would happen overnight if we had a different Congress. And by the way, there are a number of Congress members that want to change the laws and want to undo uh, big parts of the telecommunications bill. They're a minority of a few dozen progressive Democrats. We have to uh, talk about re-regulation. We have to revisit the whole point about the airwaves being publicly owned and the TV station and radio station owners therefore being obliged to observe certain regulations. And again, the First Amendment will be used to interfere with this. But if we uh, can offer a coherent and, and compelling argument about the First Amendment being there for the people and not for commercial interests, we can have that discussion. We can talk about re-regulation. And we can begin to talk back against this, this whole recent move to discredit any notion of public interest on First Amendment grounds. I think that's perverse. My concern is that there are enormous problems facing our country which need serious discussion. They are solvable problems. They can be solved if we as a nation begin debating these issues, formulating policy, implementing that policy. I am outraged. I am frustrated beyond belief that the most important issues facing America, the decline in the standard of living of working people, our disastrous trade policy, our disastrous health care policy, the, high, the priorities of this country by which we have the highest rate of childhood poverty in the world and at the same time we give huge tax breaks to the rich, the loss of local control if you like, the fact that we're becoming less and less de democratic in the sense that people have less and less control over their own lives. All of those issues need to be discussed. None of those issues in any substantive way are being discussed by the media. And what is happening is the media is throwing out to us every day the scandal of the day, the sensationalism. We go from the NBA playoffs, the NCAA playoffs, the Super Bowl. We're thrown every day the things that we are supposed to be interested in, but none of those things are relevant to our lives. How do we improve this country so that everybody has a decent standard of living? And how do we save the environment? And how do we deal with all of the race prejudice and the gender prejudice that exists? Can we as a nation do it? You're damn well. We can do it. This is a great nation. We have a lot of extraordinarily good people here. But we will not solve those problems until they are discussed. These issues will not be discussed until the media focuses on them. And the media will not focus on it so long as you have a handful of corporations controlling it and using the media only to expand their profit base rather than improve our democracy. Florida. Oh, sorry if you don't want to talk about this, but you know, I know people say get over it. I ain't ever getting over it. <laughs> too, many, too many people died to the right to this vote. Every investigation has shown that if you count the whole state, Gore wins. If you count just the four counties, if you did just a recount of the four counties that Gore wanted recounted, Gore loses. So that's what the Republicans say. Well, hey, by Gore's standard, Bush wins. Hey, guess what? Gore doesn't get to decide. If Gore was too stupid to not want the whole state counted, a position that hopefully the Democrat would have had, right? Why does the country have to suffer because of his stupidity? So he formed the Arbusto Oil Company. And who was one of the investors of the Arbusto Oil Company? Bin Laden family money. Are you aware of this? What kind of a, is this just a coincidence that a Bin Laden attacked this country and killed 3,000 Americans while the son of an oil man here sat in the White House? Is that just, I guess it is, right? July, if you go to the BBC website, you'll see a story from 1997 that says Taliban delegation hosted by oil executives in Houston. Are you aware of this? That while Bush was governor of Texas, Taliban leaders made several trips to Houston to meet with oil company executives to discuss the building of a pipeline across Afghanistan to bring natural gas from the Caspian Sea from the former Soviet republics through Afghanistan into Pakistan and out to the sea. Go to the Canadians. Go outside the country and read something in English. 
and you will find some amazing facts. The circulation of the post is going up. Since we've been using bigger headlines, we've had more circulation. Uh, I can't explain that. Why? Uh, although at Grand Central the other night, uh, or a couple of weeks ago, they had the, the headline, our headline was, Shah's nephew murdered, which was you know, a perfectly legit story, but it had, had a very large headline. The paper, they couldn't sell the paper fast enough. You're and talking about the size of the print. Size of the print, I don't know, what is it, 90 point or something. It was enormous. I don't think the big headlines will, will sell the papers, but it will attract people just to look at it. I think you get more news from television. Do you think it's more accurate? I think so. I think so. Why? Uh, you got more known uh, newscasters than you do in uh, newspapers. Uh -huh. yeah. Would you withhold news uh, for the public's good? No I, I, no, I wouldn't withhold news. But you see, in a case, if you're, a if you're reporting, uh, the likelihood or the prospects of a shortage of gas. That is where this contextual reporting that I speak of comes into it. You must explain that while in, in the last instance 10% of our imports come from Iran, effectively through the market, much of that goes to heating oil, therefore it doesn't go direct to, uh, to the gas pump. So the effective shortage is really only 1%. Newspapers um, they don't invent stories. They go to people, experts in this country, uh, for their opinions on what's coming down or not coming down. Um, and if the um, Federal Reserve, Reserve Board chairman says that I think that uh, we're in for a period of belt tightening, or if uh, a senator, if the head of a government department says I think we're going to have inflationary times ahead, uh, that makes a news story. Then as a follow-up to that, uh, you might speak to Milton Friedman or someone in Chicago and he'll say, yes, unless we have a much tighter monetary policy or a much looser monetary policy, depending on his mood, uh, we will have inflation. When Bill Kennard was appointed by Clinton to become the head of the FCC in 1997, I think it was, and, and he took over, and he was, he was in office for about three years, I mean, one of the first things, he had, well, he had really only two or three things he was going to try to do. It's funny, when Kennard came into office, what he, he told me, I interviewed him, he said, before he assumed office as head of the FCC, he went and had uh, breakfast or lunch with all the previous heads of the FCC, most of them still live in Washington, who are still alive, trying to pick their brains to figure out, you know, how he could be a good chair of the FCC. And he said, one of them pulled him aside and said, look, son, um, let me explain to you how the system works. It goes like this. When you're the head of the FCC, what you have to do to be successful is you have to understand you're refereeing fights between the, the super rich and the super, super rich. And the key to being successful is if you give the super rich lobby money one week, the next week you have to give it to the super, super rich. You'll, you'll be unsuccessful if you give all your money to the same group. You've got to balance them off. But that's what it's all about. And Kennard goes, God, I was so depressed when I heard that. I realized this is really not much of a job. It's really pretty corrupt. But he, but he was determined, to his credit, uh, to take one or two initiatives that would go outside the boundaries of traditional sort of what you could accomplish with the SEC. And one of them was he was convinced that we had to do something about this crisis of TV political ads, of campaign spending, to sort of rejuvenate the democracy or juvenate the democracy. And what he wanted to do was a very modest program of having free campaign time for candidates on the air prior to elections. So if they couldn't afford advertising, they would at least have a chance to reach the public. <clears throat> now, this, of course, wouldn't directly hurt the, the TV stations in the sense that they could still sell their TV ads uh, to candidates. But it would mean also the candidates would be less reliant upon uh, those TV ads to reach the public. And secondly, it would mean that those candidates, uh, there'd be less time for the stations to sell because they'd have to give free time away, which, of course, they hate to do, even though it's public property that they don't pay for. So uh, he said, I'll try, he just broached the idea Maybe we should have some free campaign time for candidates as a condition of a broadcast license, since they're getting these valuable licenses for free. And Kennard made it, said that the response was unbelievable. You know, within two days, uh, within two days, people in Congress said if he continues with this, they'll have hearings to close down the FCC. Um, I, actually, this isn't yeah, you know, this isn't top secret. This is actually published. I think it was Billy Towson, uh, head of the relevant committee in the House of Representatives. Uh, but it was the head of the committees. I mean, this was not obscure stuff. Uh, likewise, he said, and here... Is it, is it Cody Roberts' brother? 
Tommy Boggs, a, a very big uh, NAB lobbyist? It sounds right. right. It wouldn't surprise me. Right. They've got a lot. Uh, likewise, uh, Kennard said he went to breakfast with some friends a couple days later. Well, what Kennard said is he traveled around the country his first few months in office. And whenever he'd raised the subject in any sort of public group, without exception, across the board, the response was enthusiastic. Everyone said, this is a great idea. Conservative, liberal, whatever your views, this is a great idea. No one could disagree with this. We're giving these companies this money. Let's get some free time for candidates. It can only be good for democracy. Uh, but he said... After he announced this in Washington, it was like he'd set off a neutron bomb or something, or like he'd uh, threatened chemical warfare. Congress threatened hearings to the FCC. He said he was taken to breakfast by old friends who were powerful in Washington. He didn't name their names. And they told him if he continued this, it would end his career. Uh, so he'd more or less sort of dropped it, uh, understanding that it was impossible. But he said, isn't this ironic? Something that are, once you leave Washington, everyone loves. But as soon as you're in the Washington... Big money so controls the reins of debate, it's simply not even an issue you can raise. It's simply off the table. There are two other things that have been going on that are far more important in terms of media ownership. Uh, the first is something called vertical integration, which is another economics term. You know, horizontal integration means instead of producing 10% of the movies in the market, you produce 30%. So you're getting owned more and more of the market. Vertical integration means you own the different layers of production. So you not only produce movies, you also own the, the video rental store, the TV network, and the movie theaters where they're exhibited. And if you own production and distribution. And it's always been understood in economics and among regulators that vertical integration, far more than horizontal integration, or as much as horizontal integration, is the key to sort of guarantee locking in profit and limiting competition. Because if you own like all the movie theaters and you own film production, if someone wants to compete with you, they've got to start up a whole movie theater chain and uh, start a movie studio. Uh, if, if they're separate industries, they'd only have to start one or the other, and then they could compete. It makes the degree of difficulty much higher. It also makes your profits much higher because you have much less risk. If you can guarantee theaters for your films when you make them, uh, you're a filmmaker, you know that. That makes your job a lot easier than if you make a film and you've got to go out and try to find someone to exhibit it. And if you own the TV stations that are going to promote these films. And the yeah, the well, get, yeah. So in any case, vertical integration... Is something that regulators traditionally have really discouraged in media, understanding, you know, for a long time, for example, TV networks were not permitted to produce their own primetime shows. Because they knew if TV networks could produce their own primetime shows, they would never, no one else could produce them. They'd, they'd lock up the market. They wouldn't let anyone do it. So they prohibited that for a long time. And there was actually a flowering uh, business in Hollywood of independent companies that made primetime TV shows, uh, which is pretty much in the process of disappearing now that that re regulation's been relaxed. Because uh, it's very rational for a big company to want to be vertically integrated. And once your competitors are vertically integrated, you've got to do it or you can't compete. What are the advantages of uh, synergy or conglomeration? Well, one of them that's absolutely important is what's called cross-promotion. What, what that means is if you make a movie, for example, um, you can promote that movie across all your media properties. Uh, at a much lower cost than if you actually had to buy ads. And you can work it into your other media properties. So when, for example, Viacom, which owns Paramount, made a movie for Clueless in the early to mid-90s, uh, which is a big hit, um, what it was able to do is it, it could run advertising and promotion for Clueless incessantly on MTV and on Nickelodeon to generate an audience. Uh, it couldn't have done that if it hadn't owned MTV and Nickelodeon. Uh, likewise, when Paramount Pictures put out a Rugrats movie based on their cartoon on Nickelodeon, they could have the Entertainment Tonight show, which they own and produce, do a week-long special on the making of the Rugrats movie. So this gives you promotional ability that's really quite impressive. You can create a market for a product that would be impossible if you only made movies and you didn't have those other tools. And so it means basically everyone's got to be part of one of these systems, so they really are at a competitive disadvantage. You just can't survive, which is why the independents all sell off, because they're worth so much more uh, to a conglomerate, and they can't compete as an independent. It's not clear you can make a lot of money by being a dominant player in a lot of different media sectors. In fact, you have to be a dominant player in a lot of media sectors. So the largest media companies today are all full-scale media conglomerates, meaning that while in music, for example, there are five companies that sell 90% of the music, four of those five companies are part of the six largest media companies in the world that have film studios, TV networks, book publishing interests, the works. 
uh, all the film studios, all the major film studios are part of the largest media conglomerates that have TV networks, TV stations, music companies. All across the board, the independent big company that just does music, just does books, just does films, has gone the way of the dodo. The economics of the industry are such that there are such spectacular advantages to being a conglomerate, what they call synergy, that if you aren't one, you can't survive, you can't compete. And it's, this has been sort of the motor economic force that has spurred this tremendous amount of concentration unbeknownst to the public. Like the music industry in the 1950s, you know, it was pretty easy to start a new a uh, music company, recording company. There were dozens and dozens. And most of the giants just were barely in existence then, uh, the ones that dominate today. Now, if you're, now think for a second in a way most people don't think. Think like you're an owner of one of these companies, not a, someone who buys records or buys newspapers, but someone rather who owns the company that produces films, produces music, produces newspapers. And you're trying to make as much money as possible. And, and like, you know, one of the myths of our society, you've probably heard this one, is it's based on competition. Have you heard that? That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's the sort of pablum they feed us in the bottom fish. The truth of the matter is at the top of the system, the key to the system is crushing competition. I mean, the reason why Bill Gates is worth $60 billion isn't because there are 10,000 people selling the same product as him. It's because there's no one else selling the same product as him effectively. He's got a monopoly. If you go right down the list of all the great fortunes, the less competition you have, it's an iron law. The more likely you are to clean up. Uh, that's the goal. It's irrational to want competition for yourself. It's rational to want all your, everyone else to have competition. You want workers to compete for jobs. You want suppliers to compete to sell you stuff. But in your market, the rational thing is to smash all competition. So what we've seen in media rationally is that in all the sectors, you've had fewer and fewer companies. The largest companies buy the small companies. They try to get bigger and bigger and make it harder for new companies to enter. Because once you have just a handful of companies dominate an industry, the ability for someone to enter the industry as a newcomer is almost impossible once there are a few companies that are huge. And that process has taken place in our media system in the last 50 years dramatically. It's built right into the system. Take music as the classic case. You know, dozens and dozens of record companies in the 50s. It was relatively easy to start. Dozens and dozens. Well, they've got smaller and smaller and smaller. And pretty soon you had to have global distribution networks to distribute your fare and to collect money for it. So if you wanted to start to compete, you had to be able to set up a global distribution system. The cost of doing that's very high. How many music companies do we have today that sell 90% of the music in the United States? Five. Five companies. 80% of the music in the world. And you can't start a music company now and compete with those guys. The costs are so high, it's an irrational thing to do. That process has taken place in movie theater ownership and radio and television, book publishing. They've all shrunk down. That's called horizontal um, integration in economic terms. I mean, you, you shall sell more and more of your market. And that tends to be a very bad thing for the general public and a very good thing for those companies. Because it's great for you if you're one of only five companies. It means you can control your prices you sell at, you face much less risk, and your chance of making profits are much higher. And, and you have less threat of new competition. It gives them more market power and less competition the bigger they are to do as they want to make as much money as possible. And they use that in many ways, but most notably they use it first and foremost to sort of hyper-commercialize the content. Uh, to basically take every nanosecond of time, every square uh, centimeter of space, and try to find a way to make money off of it. And so we've marinated our entire media culture in, in sort of a, a grotesque commercialism that very in, uh, undermines the, the great work that could be done. I mean, we, we spend billions and billions of dollars on media in this country, but the, what we get for it is much less than we should. And there's, we produce some great stuff, but it's well below what could be produced under different circumstances, especially about, given the um, immense amount of resources that go to it. Then you say, well, what exactly did these debates take place? I've never seen them in the newspaper, on TV. I've never heard about them. Politicians don't debate them. When did they allocate the cable systems? When did they allocate the TV channels? When did they set up these rules giving go copyright protection to these big companies so they can keep you know, gouging money with monopoly rights to these products? And uh, the fact is that they all take place, but you just don't know about them. And they take place behind closed doors, and that is the truth of how our media system is structured. And the, and the fact is that media companies live in fear that the American people will ever find out about this and actually intervene. I mean, it's the great fear they have. They want this thing closed off. The classic case of this came, uh, it's historically shown time and time again, but in 1995 and 1996, when the, the government 
the Congress passed the Telecommunications Act, which changed entirely all the laws really regarding uh, electronic media in the United States. Uh, so obsessed were the media companies that this thing not ever get into public debate that they dis discouraged even congressional hearings on the most controversial matters. They wanted all this stuff done as quietly as possible. Because uh, they understand once people hear about, gee, we're giving away $70 billion in free airwaves to these companies, well, I th while we're cutting out food stamps for poor people, you know, what's going on? This is, this is crazy. Why is welfare for billionaires okay, but not for, you know, starving people okay? Uh, that that wouldn't, flash, that wouldn't pass. The American people wouldn't stand for it. The, the thing that has to be understood that's not understood at all is that we don't, our media system is the natural thing. It's not like uh, uh, the mountain ranges that geologically evolved over hundreds of millions of years or the solar system. It's something like we can't control. Uh, it's you know, something that's millions or hundreds of millions of years old. It's out, we just have to accept it for the duration of our lifetimes on Earth. Media systems, communication systems, are entirely the result of policies uh, that create them. Uh, it was government policies that create the whole television and radio system by l allocating airwaves to certain companies. Uh, you know, once you give someone monopoly rights to television stations, in, uh, to television frequencies in Los Angeles, Chicago, and New York, a trained chimpanzee can become a billionaire running those. It's pretty hard to blow it. The government creates uh, these companies, creates the giants. All our largest media companies, without exception, the largest five or six, are built around government sanctioned monopolies, monopoly rights to airwaves or monopoly rights to cable systems. Then they can use those monopoly profits to go out and buy film studios and other things. So what you see are uh, things like book contracts given to someone for a few million dollars to curry their favor with an advance uh, to a Newt Gingrich, say, in the United States that Murdoch's company did, or to the leader of China's daughter, uh, as he did in China. And that's done periodically, but even that doesn't, that's really small potatoes. I mean, the real corruption comes in a place like China, where when Murdoch's trying to set up his TV service, he will uh, do a joint venture with the Chinese, where the Chinese half will be represented by the children of the Central Committee. So, I mean, you're setting up the children of the head of the Chinese Communist Party as partners in a multi billionaire dollar venture. That's the real corruption. That's when we're talking the serious stakes here. I mean, PR is based on something very fundamental to human nature, which is if I tell you that my last book is the best book that's ever been written, you're going to say, yeah, of course you are, because you're selling the book. It's in your interest. But if someone else tells you that, that I don't know, that I have no connection to, you're going to be more likely to believe them. That's the whole principle. You use public relations to pummel the population. Uh, with messages that, you know, labor unions are bad, government spending is bad, business is good, entrepreneurs create jobs, and keep a steady stream of propaganda on behalf of the corporate interests so that you don't have to fear, as Madison feared, that the mass of the property list will use their political power to exercise their uh, own interest against the interests of the few. Now, the case of Murdoch is very interesting in his news corporation because this is, an example of this, he's taken this really to its fullest extent with his Fox News Channel. The Fox News Channel, which is his American TV news service, uh, is very interesting because it doesn't do journalism. They basically disbanded the whole notion of covering news because that's expensive. Instead, what they have are basically people pontificate, like Bill O'Reilly and Hannity and Combs and Britt Hume. They don't really do any journalism. They sort of bark out opinions in the air. And what Rupert Murdoch has shown is that you can make more money doing that than doing what CNN was doing. CNN was actually had 25 foreign bureaus or whatever, or some figure like that. They're actually breaking stories, trying to do journalism, for better or for worse, but they're actually trying to do journalism. Well, they were making um, pretty good money doing that. Actually, they were quite profitable doing that. But Rupert Murdoch showed you could make the same revenues doing his journalism and cut your costs in half by getting rid of all the journalists and just having pontificators. And so they've set the sort of new, they've lowered the bar now. So what happened at CNN is in 1999, uh, they got rid of, or in 2000, excuse me, they fired their president, or removed him, he left, uh, as the head of CNN, even Rick Kaplan. Even though under Kaplan's stead, you know, CNN, in its last year he was running it, made something like $300 million net 
um, sales of just over a billion dollars. I mean, spectacularly successful. But Kaplan, that wasn't good enough because Fox had shown if you get rid of all these foreign bureaus and reporters and just have pontificators, you can lower your costs and keep the revenues the same. You make another couple hundred billion. And that's what, you know, that's what they wanted Kaplan to do. And he said, no, I, that's not the way I'm going to do it. That's, that's not good journalism. But Rupert Murdoch has shown you can keep taking that bar lower and lower uh, and make money. And, he, and that's, this system is always going to gravitate to wherever that bar can be the lowest to make the most money, because that's the logic in it. There's always going to be someone, if Rupert Murdoch doesn't do it, Sumner Redstone will do it, or Michael Eisner, or someone else. Whether you, if you've got one newspaper in the market or 100, if they're trained professionals, you're going to get the same story. So you might as well just have one, because they're all trained professionals. They're going to cover it neutrally, professionally, the same way. That's the theory of professional journalism. Now, we know a couple things about it right away. First of all, um, it's not neutral. Uh, ben Bagdikian has a wonderful discussion of this in his book, The Media Monopoly. It's really quite the uh, starting point of this discussion. Built into this, of course, are, are key values that turn professional journalism uh, in certain specific directions. It's not entirely neutral. I mean, the idea that you can be neutral is nonsensical anyway. I mean, something's got to be on the front page. Something's going to be buried in the back, and something's not going to get covered at all. You've got to make value judgments. I mean, it, you just can't get around that to begin with. Uh, so if you look at the biases that are built into the whole professional model, even at its best, they're fairly striking. A manipulation is a science. And I think in this case, um, this notion of liberal media goes to the core, the, the core problem that the free market right the, the faces in our society and has faced for a long time, and it's a dire problem today, is that the agenda of the free market right, which is to enrich the few and screw over the many, doesn't work. The majority of the people don't like it. They never have. Uh, you don't win elections on lowering taxes on billionaires and slashing social services to the middle class and working class. Uh, but that's the ultimate agenda of the free market right. But they, so you don't win elections, that, that's not the issues you run on. So you find all other things to run on, patriotism, racism, uh, abortion, you, gay rights. You don't want to talk about the ultimate underlying purpose, the whole purpose of your agenda. And uh, that's the way it's always dressed up. And uh, you know, that's what our journalism has fallen completely within that trap. I mean, it, uh, the great truths of economic inequality, of, of economic relations, uh, gets sort of compartmentalized and marginalized. So that debate uh, is lost. And we're stuck in the absurd situation where you know, working class individuals' economic concerns uh, somehow get sort of turned into sort of like, uh, uh, whether they're anti-immigration rather than fundamental concerns about social services, education, and health care. The whole notion of the liberal bias uh, of the 60s and 70s, that argument was made, has completely collapsed. Uh, there is no uh, credible argument for the liberal bias. And in fact, what you see today, when it is talked about, and it still is talked about, I mean, it's still the legal opposition, the official opposition of our media culture. When you see talk today about the liberal bias, uh, the credible argument, not credible, the argument is no longer made that news media are hard on Republicans and easy on, on Teddy Kennedy and Ralph Nader. That's not the argument. That argument is so ludicrous as it, would, it doesn't even pass the giggle test. The argument now simply redefines left to right entirely in ways that drop out core issues of class, core issues of corporate power. And this is how you'll see a Chris Matthews use it or Bill O'Reilly uh, or the Wall Street Journal. In this strange world that they inhabit, their vision of left to right is this. Um, the, Liberals are Ivy League intellectuals who believe in gay rights and abortion rights and um, um, don't necessarily go to church. And they're rich and hoity-toity types. And conservatives are people like them, hardworking, beer drinking, uh, oftentimes Catholic, working class, usually white people uh, who believe in God and America and kicking ass. What we have increasingly is that the private sector is virtually off limits. It's simply not uh, covered at all. Private power, which is so truly important to really understand how power exists in our society, uh, is uncovered uh, in any sort of critical journalism. Uh, it's, it's sort of given carte blanche to just trot right on through life. Uh, and public power is only covered in very 
uh, narrow parameters. The sorts of issues they get covered are the ones that um, tend to be debates between uh, the mainstream political parties. And issues that the mainstream political parties are in agreement upon, uh, there's virtually no coverage whatsoever in our news media, no critical watchdog coverage. For example, the military establishment in this country, um, for which we spend hundreds of billions of dollars every year for no known reason, uh, is not covered critically because both political parties are in bed with it. They're both debating who can raise the budget the most. I mean, that's the big fight. That type of right wing, anti-labor, pro-business right wing, uh, has made a concerted effort uh, to move uh, media to the right. They understood that uh, a, uh, media was not sympathetic enough to their aims, that, that they weren't getting the coverage they liked. Media is too much reflecting the opinions of people who weren't rabidly pro-free market. The media wasn't socialist, but it was more welfare statist. It was more comfortable in accepting things like social security as being a legitimate enterprise rather than questioning it. And uh, the, what we've seen since the mid-1970s is that all the great conservative foundations have devoted almost all their money to ideological warfare. About half of it's gone into fight changing the media, moving it rightward, and about half of it has gone into educational institutions, you know, creating chairs and free enterprise and business schools or journalism schools. Uh, but the whole idea is what the conservatives have done with their money is say, we're going to put all our money into ideological warfare to try to move everything to the right, and then we'll let the, all the liberal foundations just you know, give breakfast to poor kids. You know, they can pick up the pieces of the mess we're going to make. But we're, just, we're not going to worry about doing anything but moving the whole political debate to the right to free market solutions as much as humanly possible. Let's say you're trying to change journalism. Let's say you're, you think concert journalism is not sufficiently appreciative and in love with free markets, big business, that it's too sympathetic to labor unions, too sympathetic to environmental regulations, too sympathetic to old age pension programs like Social Security, that you want to get a journalism that's more in tune with the issues as you see them. Well, how can you change it? Well, you can try buying the media, uh, but that, does, that costs a lot of money and you actually already own it. The problem isn't that you know, conservatives don't own the media. The people, who, the biggest shareholders have conservative politics. Uh, that's not the issue. Uh, the problem is that this, there's a certain amount of autonomy and professional practices here you've got to intervene with. How do you do that uh, besides owning it and crushing the separation of church and state? Well, there are two or three real key ways, if you understand how journalism works, that you do that. One is you try to train more conservatives to become journalists. So starting in the late 60s and early 70s, you saw the growth of a, a whole coterie of college newspapers built around conservative values. There's one at Dartmouth, I think the Dartmouth Review is the classic one. We've, most major campuses had one, they still have them. So that instead of just having the college liberal newspaper growing out of the 60s or 70s with hippies and radicals writing for it, you'd have a red, white, and blue flag-waving, free market-loving conservative paper. But then you'd be training like hundreds of journalists in these papers who would then go on and get jobs and internships at the Washington Times. Uh, at the Wall Street Journal, at, very, at the National Review, and you could start building up uh, an armada of right-wing conservative journalists who can then become talking heads on the Fox News Channel and MSNBC uh, and sort of pontificate conservative viewpoints. That was one thing you do, and it's been very effective. It's been a, they've really created a whole farm system to train right-wing, free market-loving, labor union-hating journalists who will basically parrot whatever the right-wing line of the day is, as we've seen. The other thing you do is you try to give sources. So much of journalism depends on who the source of the story is. And so you've seen the, foundation, the creation of these foundations or institutes in Washington, like the American Enterprise Institute, the Heritage Foundation, the Cato Institute, that basically are extraordinarily well-funded groups. I mean, they're millions and millions of dollars. And they, they have experts from, from wealthy right-wingers, and there are a lot of them. Uh, there are people who, uh, the, the Coors family, the, the Mellons, uh, there are lots of very rich people in this country, most of whom have inherited their money, who think any taxation on them is an onerous burden, who think uh, Social Security and labor unions are terrible things, uh, of course they don't benefit by either of them, and are committed to an ideological view that we want to roll the clock back to a point where business is in unambiguous control of society, with no taxation, and this full function of government being to provide police to protect private property or military to keep foreign countries in line if they challenge investments overseas. This is the worldview, in fact, more or less, of these various far-right, free-market-loving institutes. 
But what they realize is if they just sort of come off frothing at the mouth with sort of free market rhetoric, they're not going to get anywhere. Uh, rather, what they did is they started uh, these foundations, institutes, Cato, Heritage, American Enterprise Institute, uh, and there are others as well, uh, in Washington, and then employ uh, at very high salaries oftentimes sort of experts on issues. And these experts then uh, can be called on by media for opinions and insights on issues. Someone like you. Okay. Someone like me, conceivably. Uh, for example, let's say George W. Bush is going to appoint someone to the Supreme Court. He makes an appointment. Well, there will be two or three of these right-wing groups will have a full-time or close to full-time expert on staff who will be able to answer any questions about this person or talk at, at length on this issue. So you, if you're a source and you can have, have someone weigh in on trade deals, on Supreme Court appointments, on tax bills, giving your perspective, if you've got a series of people who are sound like they know what they're talking about of all sorts of degrees, you can really influence the news. So they put a lot of money into creating this enormous bank of sources, and it's been very effective. The Internet, the rise of the Internet, is the most important issue uh, that faces people in media uh, of this generation. It's the central defining issue, uh, not just for media, but really for just about everything else. It's the defining technology of our age. And the argument has gone, starting in the early to mid-90s, um, that the Internet is going to basically eliminate the existing media system. The classic comment on this came from uh, John Perry Barlow, a lyricist for the Grateful Dead, who was a, sort of one of the original sort of cyber uh, enthusiasts. And he argued that uh, we don't have to worry about these big media giants buying up film studios and TV networks because all they're doing is rearranging deck chairs in the Titanic. The iceberg they're going to hit is the Internet with its limitless number of channels, 500 billion. And once you've got options of 500 billion channels in the Internet, who's going to care about Rupert Murdoch's Rinky Fox channel or General Electric's NBC? You're going to have hundreds of millions of other choices. They're just going to fade away. They're going to become extinct. They're going to be like the dinosaurs after the comet hits the planet. That's basically the argument. And that argument is used widely now by the media giants themselves. When AOL merges with Time Warner, when Viacom swallows up CBS, when Vivendi buys Universal, the argument is, well, we've got to get bigger and bigger, otherwise we're going to get killed by the Internet when it comes along with its 500 billion channels. So we've got to get bigger and bigger so we can, what they mean is they crush all the competition before it gets started. What is the evidence that the Internet is going to overthrow the existing media system? That the Internet is going to eliminate the big giants like Disney and Rupert Murdoch's uh, News Corporation and replace them with, you know, billions of small-time entrepreneurs with a copy of George Gilder's polemics under their arm, sort of competing in the commercial golden marketplace of ideas, and we all live happily ever after. Have we seen a flowering in the marketplace with all sorts of new viable competitors um, who are going to take on the media giants and use the Internet to enter the media world? In fact, what Let's do a survey. How many successful, commercially viable uh, companies have come along to use the Internet as a platform to become successful media content providers to compete with the Disney's and AOL Time Warner's? How many has the Internet launched? Zero. L. Zipperuski. None. No. So, so far, the track record isn't very impressive. Uh, there are lots of people have tried. And they've all gone belly up, or they're all losing money and hoping someone will buy them out and save them. No one's been able to make it profit using the internet as a platform to sell media content or to provide media content on the internet. So, so far, the internet is a challenge to the commercial media system, a direct challenge where it's going to steal market, non-existent. It hasn't happened at all after seven years. Uh, and all signs point that it's not going to happen in the foreseeable future. You couldn't raise a nickel on Wall Street today for an IPO for an internet media content site. Hey, I'm going to start a content site on the internet. Give me 50 million. It, you couldn't get past the intern at the front door with that message. You'd be hurled out in your butt. I mean, you see the evidence for this. Uh, Microsoft, Microsoft, mind you, with its deep pockets, with its billions of dollars it's sitting on in cash, uh, was it trying to go into the Internet and use it as to become a content player, saying, now we can sort of do content, too. We have to do that. They started their magazine, Slate. They were going to do um, a local newspaper type thing with want ads and listings in every city. Uh, they, were, they spent you know, tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars trying to bankroll a content presence in the Internet. And a couple of years ago, they threw in the towel. They said, we can't do it. We can't compete with the giants. There's not money here for us. We give up. Uh, Microsoft gives up. 
You know, what chance do you or I or some entrepreneur have? The answer is zero. In the case of digital television like the Internet uh, and digital media in general, I mean, technically, you're absolutely right. We had possibly uh, tremendous possibilities. Uh, but what the government has done, pushed by these powerful lobbies, is it's basically saying to the Wall Street, to these companies, you guys make, do, you develop these technologies however you can make the most money. That's what it's all about, and that's what will, that'll be the best way to serve us. Now, what satisfies these companies to make the most money, in fact, is going to be directly opposite or diametrically opposed or significantly divergent, at the very least, from what we might actually want if we had a range of possibilities to pick from. I, it isn't in our interest to basically have a half dozen companies own all the airways and then sort of marinate us with uh, advertising and commercialism. We'd all, I think, much prefer to have 30 or 40 different owners or 60 or 70 different owners, uh, with restrictions on commercialism if the market doesn't prove sufficient. Uh, there's a real diversity. But that wasn't a choice that was given to us because the big companies that dominated these debates, that wasn't an issue that, uh, a position that interested them. None of them could make money off that position. The notion that the Internet uh, was created or has grown because of no governmental involvement is, of course, dead wrong. The internet uh, is free and open because of, not in spite of, governmental policies that have prohibited uh, discriminatory uses of this technology. Uh, the fight is to maintain the status quo. The interesting thing from our standpoint is that we are really fighting to keep a system that was set up a particular way to keep it from changing rather than having to take a system that's already broken and try to fix it. It's a lot easier to try to maintain the relative pristine nature of the Internet today than it is to try to fix something that, that's completely and hopelessly dominated. And that's, if there's cause for optimism, that's where it, that's where it lies. I think history's proven that facts on the ground are, you know, it's possession is nine-tenths of the law. Correct. And, and, <laughs> and Michael Powell on this open access question that we're talking about, this is exactly where the philosophical divide comes in. He is a strong proponent of the watchful waiting view, which is that you see what happens and then you try to move in and do something to protect competition if you see a problem arise. Uh, uh, that doesn't work. What works is identifying competitive bottlenecks in advance, and really this is a tradition that, that lies in the heart of the FCC's public interest legal powers, to identify potential competition and to make sure that the bottlenecks don't happen, to move prophylactically to protect competition rather than try to attack it afterwards. If you wait until the bottleneck develops and then try to break it up, what you have is litigation like the Microsoft case that runs on years and years and years and years while the monopoly continues. Murdoch's efforts to um, uh, ingratiate himself with the Chinese government, which have been pretty well reported, uh, are more blatant and um, uh, uh, more transparent than many of than almost anything that we deal with domestically in the United States. Uh, the kind of raw power that works in, in places like China and works in places like Eastern Europe uh, doesn't work in, in true democracies. And Murdoch is capable of being much more subtle and, and much more insidious, I would say, in Australia, in England, in, in, in the U.S. than he is in China. But when he has the op it, it, it's useful, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, instructive, kind of uh, experience when the political system permits something that is uh, 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 more blatant, uh, he's very comfortable doing it. Basically, he has uh, 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 changed the way in which uh, programming is presented and covered uh, uh, to satisfy the desires of the Chinese government uh, for, uh, for uh, purposes of getting a competitive advantage, and not every one of his competitors has been willing to do so. And this is a second point that feeds into the same thing with who has really been given attention and who has really been given the respect in this debate. And I want to make sure it's right, because we know we've got problems with accuracy in the media. So I want to make sure this article in the New York Times is right. It says, 
<laughs> it says that media lobbyist Dick Wiley, whose clients, I don't know the man, he's probably out there, I, whose clients include numerous large media companies and partners at his firm, held at least 34 meetings with FCC officials, according to the record, the open record. Why is it in the best interest of people to the left or liberals or whatever they want to call us to help you to consolidate in ways that your conservative views will be more and more dominant? We will get shut out. I'm worried that as you go before DOJ, and maybe, I don't know if Mr. Ashcroft is your friend or not, his conservative views will be reflected in your programming. So why should we, why, why should we support this, even though we don't have direct responsibility for approval or disapproval? Maybe some of us should make a hell of a lot more noise than we're making, because you're scaring the hell out of me. Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, I can assure you that, um, that we are bringing diversity of opinion uh, we are, there is diversity of opinion on Fox News. You may disagree with that. We have many liberals there, many liberals uh, invited. We have liberal commentators, as we have conservative ones. Who are your liberal commentators? Just, uh, Alan Combs, for one. Um, Greta Van Susteren. Um, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder, I guess. I know you've had problems. Uh, you've made statements about uh, Mr. O'Reilly. And of course, one of the problems of, uh, of the modern media is that it has tended to obliterate the local political meeting. I was elected uh, in 1984 for Chesterfield, the mining town, and in the course of three weeks, I did 70 public meetings. Uh, people came to churches, came to meetings, you spoke in the open air, and you could hear the candidate. Nowadays, all you do is hear the media's description of what the candidate is saying. And uh, one of the strange things about it is that politics is now presented in terms of politicians and not politics. I don't think the media are interested in politics. They're interested in politicians, which is a wholly different subject. Who's doing this, about their private life, about their background, about what they must be thinking, might be thinking when they said something, why did they say it? But what they say is very, very hard to hear. And I think this is... In, in a sense, indeed quite um, deliberately, destroying the genuine democratic base on which people are elected. It's very interesting to me that uh, President Clinton, for example, was elected by only one in five of the American people. Four out of five Americans didn't register, didn't vote, or voted against him. So Clinton, on 20% of his own electorate, claimed to have a mandate and claimed uh, to exercise the power of the United Presidency, which is the most powerful position in the world, with the nuclear armory and its uh, economic and political power and so on. And that process uh, is beginning to happen here. Uh, the Labour government was elected with only one in four voting for it. And the danger of that, the political danger of that, is very, very great. Because if people don't vote, because they're not motivated to vote, because the whole thing switches them off, the spin doctors, the focus groups, all the marketing rubbish that goes into modern political argument. If they don't vote, it destroys the legitimacy of the government that is elected, and then people become cynical, and that is the moment at which the hard right picks up. Because my recollection of uh, Germany in the 1930s uh, is very, very clear. Uh, when the German people had mass unemployment, they were pessimistic, they were hopeless, they were depressed. Then they went for the man who had a scapegoat. It's the Jews, it's the communists, it's the trade unionists. And that is the danger. Democracy requires a well-informed and understanding people with clear ideas which they wish to see represented. And now we're being managed and not represented. The whole fame thing has, drives all, <laughs> almost all national affairs. Um, if, if a political figure is on TV a lot, they have more power, they're perceived as more important. And if they criticize someone or they are in the limelight doing or saying something, it has more weight than anything else. And so if you're not famous, first of all, if you're not famous, you're not going to be elected if you're a politician. If you're not famous, 
that means no one must watch you if you're a broadcaster. You may be famous on, at 2 a.m. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're in this culture where everything is measured. And, you know, I don't know what the Q rating was for Bill Clinton, but certain, certain political actors are more gifted when it comes to fame and, and the media and cultivating the media, and they play to the media's worst instincts, and, and, and they're each pandering to each other. The politician is benefiting from constant attention. Uh, the media is benefiting from their constant uh, Greek tragedy-like ups and downs in their careers. And um, the accessibility and availability and hyperactivity of a president like Clinton is fantastic in a 24-7 news cycle because you're going to have the guy playing the saxophone on, on a, a late night show and you're going to have him doing a news briefing uh, from the White House and maybe taking three trips outside D.C. all in the same day and all those media markets are just ecstatic. <laughs> all those different outlets are all ecstatic. The fame of Clinton continues. Uh, the, the, let's freeze frame all of that. Did anything in America change, however? Did any of it mean anything? Did the equation about the most powerful interest in America change when it comes to the American people? None of that was affected at all. It's like a magician. You know, the hand is quicker than I. You're watching all this stuff, and it's nothing but cotton candy. It's nothing but fluff, and it's all irrelevant. But that major thing is not to be covered. Right, but well, the major thing will not be covered. It's too close to the bone. If you show uh, the mercenary culture at work and people benefiting legally, unfortunately, from the way the system is set up, including, which would have to include the media if you do it thoroughly, then you will be exposing yourself, uh, not only to ridicule, but um, condemnation and possibly even in some cases prosecution. <laughs> and so who wants to go down that road? And so it also costs money. It's just as a practical matter, it just takes time to do those kinds of stories. And you do have to have lawyers at every, looking at every word, and you do have to be uh, buttoned down perfectly and, you know, all that. So it's a hassle. But I have been getting so frustrated by what's happened to the media that I decided we've investigated the political influence and the lobbying and other political shenanigans of all these industries, from the timber industry to the chemical industry to the, all the influences around the presidential candidates, you name it, uh, health care lobbying back in 94. We've looked at all those. Uh, and I decided it was time that we looked at the media and itself. And we... We had half a dozen people working for six months, and we investigated, and we found that, of course, that the most powerful special interest in Washington today is the media, because not only do they give money and lobby and do all the things that industries do in Washington and companies do, but they, of course, control whether or not a politician's mug gets on the tube. Now, that's power. <laughs> that's the ultimate power in, in a political realm is, is controlling perceptions. That's what I, I see with you guys. It's the old... If the tree falls in the forest and it's not captured by a video camera and broadcast, did it fall? Does it make a sound? <laughs> well, that's right. No, that's exactly right. And the, this, the fun part of our study that I'm very proud of is we had government records. So we knew that the media corporation had spent $115 million lobbying Congress. We knew the names of the firms. We know who, who they lobbied. We even know what they lobbied about. In this country, a lot of the journalists have become as wealthy as the people they cover. Depend, like uh, a lot of the in Washington, a lot of the journalists covering the president have their children at Sitwell Friends and and other private schools. And presidential uh, candidates or new presidents put their children in the same school where the journalists are in, and they compare notes about teachers. You know, and in the old days, journalists. You know, I remember there's a great line James Carville said to me uh, during the health care debate. I thought it, whatever your position on about Clinton and Carville and health care, his comment was very telling. He said, I don't think there are five reporters out there, sorry, I don't think there's a single reporter in Washington today covering the health care debate who knows five people that don't have health insurance. They can't name one probably that doesn't have health insurance. The idea of not having health insurance is like something from Mars to them. They're living such a cushy, yuppified life that, uh, that they're in a bubble. Broadcasters don't cover politics for the most part, but they're happy to take paid ads from politicians. And they've gone from $80 million in 1981 to a billion dollars in the last election as a major revenue source. So they don't cover politics, 
It's half what it was in 96. 96 was half what it was in 92 in terms of news coverage about politics. So the citizen's not going to know what the issues are. The citizen's not going to know what people are talking about or what's important or what this candidate has done that we should know about or that shouldn't know about. None of that's going to be discussed. Their source of news will be paid ads that the candidates want you to know about. And it's pretty grim. I mean, so there's a dumbing down effect, which we've talked about. And a dumbing down is, is a word I'd like to give, get a bigger definition of. Right. Well, when I say dumbing down, I mean that the information that is provided to the public is inadequate and almost non-existent. Uh, so you'll cover a complex issue like utility deregulation in 45 seconds or a minute on the evening news. Well, good luck. No one can understand anything that complicated. Even if they had 10 minutes, it'd be hard. But a, but a minute is hopeless. And uh, so the media, basically, they'll have someone crying. There'll be someone who was personally affected, or maybe the street light went out and they got hit. And we'll feel sorry for that person. But then when it gets to the larger issues, they'll start to wrap it up because it's a little too complicated. Part of that is the medium itself. Part of it is because they don't want to go near that subject for various reasons. It takes time. And they think people don't care about it. They also give the least common denominator type of programming. They assume that people want to watch who wants to be a millionaire and survivor and basically crap. Uh, and so they pander to the least common denominator. There's a lot of that goes on, and you get into debates with commercial broadcasters that, you know, well, did you notice PBS has just terrific ratings? No one watches it. And, you know, the, you get into these big discussions about what do the people really want, and if they really want all this great investigative stuff, how come no one does it? The reporter will cover the, sh the story, and the reporter goes out and presumably finds the story. All too often, the, the, the reporters, or the editors rather, put the story into a Procrustean bed, if you will. They have their minds made up at what the story is before the reporter ever goes out. And if the reporter comes back with a story that, that uh, differs from what their preconception was, they say, well, that's not the story we're looking for. Well, I'm sorry, but that's the story that's there. Now, that happens quite a bit. Today, the language is all neutered down. I mean, it's completely sanitized and, and, you know, scrubbed so that it will be substantially neutral so you won't have any idea what the person really thinks. And generally, it won't um, get anyone in trouble for saying it. And we also, of course, won't choose topics that are inconvenient or embarrassing topics. And that's what passes for news coverage. And, and the news coverage will not uh, necessarily be much more explicit than that and that's just how it works and it's just kind of understood. There's a continuum between the media and politics and you have to take into account that an awful lot of guys in, a, in, the, in politics get paid a lot of money to attempt to manipulate the media. The, these are the so-called spin doctors. Uh, these are the guys who uh, who uh, take a political candidate's message and put it across in the most effective way. They use the media to their, exam to, to their, to their uh, benefit as much as they can. And when it comes to reporters, some reporters are very sophisticated in, in not letting them do that. Other reporters, not so sophisticated because you know, this is, this is a learning process that we go through. And if, if this is your first time around covering a campaign, you have to be very careful that these slick political operatives will not try to uh, work their way into the story that you think is perfectly objective. Is it really possible these days to, to pin anyone down? Um, it seems that everyone is so good at being evasive. Um, so the, on message, so that, I mean, is it, could you discuss that? Well, an awful lot of guys are being paid an awful lot of money to make sure that, uh, that the candidate's message, the message he or she wants to put across, is what gets out to the media and not what the reporter wants to get across. And uh, pin them down, is it possible for a, uh, a reporter in, a, in, a, in, a, in an interview such as this to uh, take a politician and, uh, and make that politician uh, answer the question in a way that the politician doesn't want to? Very rarely in politics these days. Very rarely. And, and of course, the higher you get in the quest for political office, the more sophisticated the, uh, 
the uh, media manipulation becomes. I know for a fact that uh, you know, CBS, NBC, and ABC have cut uh, their international bureaus. They used to be seen all, uh, you know, they used to have big, you know, big London bureau, Paris bureau, stuff. A lot of them have cut back, so they cover stories uh, on an international level just using, and they used to, you know, have their reporter, boom, fly them in, you know, cover the story with your own tape. Now they, they, they take um, their, uh, a lot of their, their international stories off uh, a tape feed much the way we take them. Reuters feed, um, APTV, uh, stuff like that, where, you know, they're not actually in, you know, especially they're not actually covering, let's say, any kind of civil war in Africa or something. They're just getting tape from a bureau, uh, from the, the uh, AP or Reuters or something, and uh, putting it on their news. They're not, it, so the, the coverage is not the same. Everything is, is basically the uh, uh, there's a fool every minute, uh, and let's see if we can fool them. Uh, cynicism, really, um, and it's all PR. Everyone has PR. If you look at in Washington alone, uh, there are thousands of people who do, do nothing but public relations. If you look at uh, the number of uh, congressional and executive branch employees who do public relations, I don't know what the numbers are, but there's thousands of them. And 20 or 30 years ago, there were no more than a few hundred of them. So there's been an explosion in the business of image making and um, purveying information on your behalf or your agency's behalf or your company's behalf. And, and if you don't have a good PR firm working for you, and you don't have good bookers and marketers and focus group people and this and that, all the, these kind of pros, then you'll be shut out and you won't be on the shows. You won't be the one that they call. You won't be the one giving lectures to corporate groups around the country. You won't be seen as effective, and your books won't be bestsellers. Then there's also this, the obfuscation factor, which drives me up the wall. I mean, the, the revenue enhancement, not taxes, uh, you know, collateral damage, not thousands of innocent people being murdered. I mean, there, there, you get a lot of uh, the, the, uh, the, I guess what Orwell would call uh, the politically euphemistic language uh, that is used by everyone, by politicians, but also by news anchors, that will summarize in a one or two sentence lead in to a piece uh, something where you could write entire books about it, and so it'll be the most bland thing. You don't quite know what you're hearing. Oh, we're going to go today and look at such and such, and then you'll see some piece. And y you've just kind of given me the froth off the top of the beer there. I mean, I, I don't really know what you're talking about, but it passes for news and it fills 22 minutes. The conundrum for folks who are frustrated with the media and the m news media and the coverage of the news media, and I count myself among them, and I also am a veteran of the, that world, and I have many friends in that world as we speak, is that the public does watch some of this nonsense, and that's why they do it. They are pandering to the lowest common denominator, and when you criticize a news executive at one of the networks and you say, why are you putting this crap on the air? Do you have a conscience? How do you look yourself in the mirror? Their answer is, you know, people are watching that stuff. And if they can all go to the Lair News Hour if they don't, you know, what are their numbers? And they'll start doing numbers. Like news is defined like a Gallup poll, but we all put on what's most interesting to the masses, and that's what ought to be news, and that's what the news value is. It's not what the people's right to know and uh, things that they ought to know as a people in our democracy. It comes down to what sells the most and what say all the Purian sensationalistic values of either death or sex or, you know, those kinds of things. And, and that is the principal thing that drives uh, the news values, is how are your numbers? So I'm kind of fascinated by the whole thing. I, when I look back at, at what Orwell wrote and I look at Stalinist Russia and everything, what the big tragedy to me is that you have these multi-billion dollar corporations making money hand over fist obscenely rich companies. And when they get into any trouble, the first thing they'd cut are the reporters. And uh, they don't cut the people that do sell the ads, of course. They want to make more money. So their profit margins are very, very high, and they're all watching their quarterly earnings and latest financial statements. And these are media corporations that are now owned by, you know, by the Disneys and the Westinghouses and the, you know, uh, GEs of the world that have you know, sometimes checkered backgrounds when it comes to their, their own conduct as, as corporations. But they're not into disseminating information. And so you had a situation, a fairly remarkable situation, uh, last week where the chairman 
of Disney meets with the Washington Bureau of ABC News and Ted Koppel, the well-known Nightline anchor, says to Michael Eisner, the head of Disney, do you know who Dave Kaplan is? And he starts, and Koppel starts listing all of the dead journalists who died trying to cover stories all over the world. Kaplan, I, uh, I knew myself and worked with. He, he died in Bosnia and was killed by a sniper's bullet. Eisner knew none of them. They're getting ready to, to fire hundreds of employees at ABC. Koppel's point was, you guys are just making money, and this we could be making widgets here. There's no sense of responsibility as, as, as a news media of what, what you owe to the public and what you owe to this country and as a democracy. And that's outrageous, and that's worrisome. Why didn't we find out more about that bill before it was passed? Well, because who's going to report on it, the media? I mean, uh, we, we didn't find out more about it because it was not in the interest of the media to tell us that story. I mean, if you go back and study news coverage around the 1996 Telecommunications Act, the most significant law passed about the media in 50 years, there was hardly any news coverage other than a few newspaper stories. There was one nightline where Ted Koppel got into some of the issues one time uh, over the course of one year. You know, we're talking about minuscule coverage about an extraordinarily huge issue of our time. One of my hobby horses, uh, I, I actually... He had a speech before 400 government ethics officials from all over the world down in Florida back in December about what I call legal corruption. And I noted that most of the things the Center for Public Integrity has investigated over the last 11 years are, in fact, legal. Um, uh, whether it's Bob Dole getting a condominium, 100000 under the market price, from Dwayne Andreas, the head of an agribusiness multi-billion dollar corporation that's getting subsidies that Bob Dole helped get passed, and no one thinks there's a problem. That's legal. To the digital spectrum giveaway, the media has gotten $70 billion in, of a taxpayer-owned asset that's given away. Uh, the full gamut, both parties, we have a substantial amount in this country of legal corruption. We have done a massive investigation of the 50 states, uh, the state legislatures. This idea that corruption in this country is only in Washington is absurd, of course. Now, when you start patenting genes that are naturally occurring in human beings uh, and you start deciding that you own the patent for this particular gene and they start issuing patents for it and you've got a 10 or 20 billion dollar a year industry just doing the copywriting and patenting of genes, not counting the technology, just the lobbying and the patenting process, you can see what's going on here. I mean. Uh, Everything is for sale, <laughs> basically. And if you've got money and lawyers, you'll get it. You'll win. <laughs> I'm sorry to be so cynical about it, but that's kind of what happens. Florida violated the Equal Protection Clause. Only applied, they said, to Bush v. Gore, not to any other case. Now, if their ruling set forth a valid legal principle that was good enough for Bush v. Gore, why wasn't it good enough for other cases? Constitutional scholars will tell you that this is the first time in the 210-year history of the court that the court limited its ruling to the case before it, saying it did not constitute legal precedent for other cases. For any conservative people out in the audience, I would ask them to hypothesize a reversal of roles. Let's say Gore's ahead, 8 o'clock, December the 9th, Saturday morning, by 154 votes. Would Scalia have stepped in and done the same thing for Gore that he did for Bush? Who is Scalia? He's not a typical Republican or conservative. He's a right-wing ideologue of the Rush Limbaugh school. He's the judicial darling of the far right. Uh, to him, Gore is probably anathema, an execration. It is absolutely unimaginable, absolutely inconceivable that he would have stepped in and said, we've got to stop this recount because if it continues, it could threaten irreparable harm to Al Gore. That would not have happened. That could not have happened. This is a well-known secret. Scalia wants to become Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. And obviously, he knew that if Gore won, he never would become Chief Justice. Also, he has two sons that were working for law firms heavily involved in the Bush campaign. So under Title 28, U.S. Code, Section 455, if there's any conflict of interest or even an appearance of a conflict of interest, the justices have a duty 
to disqualify themselves. Lawyers say recuse themselves. These justices did not do that here. There's a code of conduct for federal judges, which is largely derived from a model document put together by the American Bar Association. Uh, the American Bar Association is a private organization, but it has invested time and money in putting together what it considers to be a wise document for states and the federal government to adopt to govern their judges. And in fact, every state has adopted that document as binding on their judges, though most states have made some changes in it. Not every state has adopted it literally. In addition, uh, the federal judiciary has adopted that document again with changes through the work of lower court judges and that's called the code of conduct for u.s judges that code of conduct applies to all lower federal judges but it doesn't apply to the supreme court because the judges who put it together the federal judges who did this did not believe that they had the authority to write rules governing the behavior of justices on the Supreme Court. So that document doesn't apply to the Supreme Court. However, the justices of the Supreme Court, or various of them, have from time to time said that although the document doesn't apply to them, uh, they will govern themselves according to its precepts.